Welcome to the Nature's Image Farm podcast. We're glad you're here. I'm Greg. And I'm Susan. And together we're raising seven kids on the farm and learning life lessons along the way. So pull up a chair, rest your heels, and let's talk all things bees, homesteading, and the old time ways. Let's get after it. If you're interested in nukes, packages, queens, or supplies, visit us on the web at naturesimagefarm.com. Well, hi, guys. Welcome back to another Stream Team Beekeeping Chat. Uh, I'm Greg Burns here at Nature's Image Farm, and we're joined by our pals Bruce Jenny at Bruce's Bees and Brian Coper from Castle Hives. Fellas, thanks for joining tonight. How's things going in your neck of the woods? Oh, come on. Rock, okay, okay guys, wait. Rock, paper, scissors. Let's see who goes first. Whatever. Go ahead, Brian. Oh, go ahead, Bruce. Go ahead, Brian. How's things okay. down in Dothan, Alabama? <clears throat> Man, right now the the uh, we are in full bloom with the privet. Pretty much, the bees are busy. They're happy. Just uh, you know, it's just one of those uh, beautiful springs so far down here. So, uh, I mean, it's just busy, fun. The bees are calm. You know, everything's going good right now. At least last time I was in them, they looked really good. So, Brian, just, uh, you've got storms ro rolling through your neck of the woods there. I think Bruce might have dodged those <laughs> tonight, but Bruce, you had storms going through not too long ago, didn't you? Yeah, they uh, luckily, I, I don't think anything major touched down. Um, there was some like they were, you know, of course, whenever they see rotation, the news interrupts everything, but there was some rotation. I don't think it quite got to the ground. It was like I think 10 miles away, so it scooted north of us. Um, so, yeah, pretty pretty interesting out here. So, but you know, I, I knew something was. I knew we were close just because it's raining like crazy and the wind's going, and then the rain stopped, and I'm looking outside like, what the heck is going on? So we were in like that buffer zone where there's like no rain, you know. So, but. You know, nothing here. Yeah, Portage County has damage. Yeah, John, yeah, they've got to. And, and you know, it went, Greg, it went right up uh, by Mosquito Lake in that. So by oh, the, right. yeah, yeah, by um, the Trumbull County beekeepers. So where is it headed next? Let's, uh, for all the folks who might be listening, uh, well, I've got to uh, give a, a special shout out to all the folks who are in our general uh, Ohio area. Uh Seems like now every storm that comes through, uh, my phone blows up with folks just saying, uh, you know, storm incoming or inbound storm. Uh, I really appreciate you guys doing that because sometimes I, you know, when you're outside, you know, you can feel everything change. You can hear things change. Uh, yeah. But the way some of these storms are, are kind of popping up and moving through, they're happening so quick. Yeah. So I'm going to thank everyone who gives us the heads up there. Let's give a, let me let's take a quick look at the radar I, here and see I think, who's, I think who's it, next. I think it fizzled out though because um, National Weather Service they didn't extend like we had a tornado warning in my area until seven thirty. Okay. And then they weren't moving it and they weren't updating it. They they said that it was pretty much just. I, I don't think the system had enough energy to do anything. So looks thankfully. yeah. I'm looking at the looking at the radar and it looks like it's all the the red and severe is kind of fading out. Looks like yeah. it's uh if you're in the uh, Pittsburgh and Morgantown. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Morgantown, West Virginia area are probably about to get uh, a little uh, rain. Uh, tonight, the skies were green. Uh, the, the rain started to just have a little bit of a pelting nature to it. So um, it seemed like it was it could have gone either way there. So thankfully, um, not not too big a deal. One, one of the best things I think that we've done, we'll talk a lot more about it as the season unfolds, but we... Um, uh, just before the last series of really heavy storms and tornadoes, we uh, got all the nukes um, into 10 frame equipment, got them on pallets, got them on the ground here um, at the at the uh, at the farm. And so now the only thing, only colonies that we have on hive stands are here um, in the learning yard. And uh, Brian uh, just visited us here uh, to pick up a package and dropped off some really nice um, hive stands, two packages. 
and uh, uh, dropped us off uh, hive stands here that I think are going to make a big difference on how we can kind of all gather around the colonies here at the learning yard. But we can also anchor these so we don't really have to worry about those ones um, flying off. So with exception to the colonies here at the learning yard, everything else that we have are on uh, you know, four-way pallets or six ways or skids of some sort. Um, and so uh, on the ridge, it really makes a big difference here um, where we're at. Uh, so well, we wanna thank everyone for tuning in tonight. Uh, hopefully you and your bees are safe and you're uh, uh, weathering the storm uh, with, with uh, no, no big deal. But uh, it's, it's that time of year, guys. Swarms, um, you know, if you're down where Bruce is at, you've already gone through this. Um, um, here in Ohio, where we're at, the first really flush of swarms uh, seem to be coming in. And I think it'd be fun to talk about that tonight because what I think we can we can follow temperature. We can also follow uh, what was in bloom when that happened. And I think um, that'll uh, be a fun talk. Uh, what, what I'd like to do tonight is uh, we're, throughout the night, we're going to have uh, some check-ins, kind of a swarm report. And what we would like you to do is in capitals, um, if you have had swarms tonight, or not tonight, if you have had swarms recently, uh, let us know in the comments, um, all capital letters, uh, put the city, state, and the date that you saw or heard of the first swarms in your area. It'd be a lot of fun to kind of track this throughout the entire um, United States. And so we just experienced our very first swarm. We'll talk more about that uh, here tonight. But swarms is the is the topic tonight. We'll also get in uh, to your questions. Uh, so leave your questions in capitals, and then a little swarm report across the country. If you'd like to chime in there, put your city, your state, and then the date that uh, swarms first appeared in your area. It could be kind of fun to track that and kind of see um, what's going on. <laughs> The first one, here we go. Castle Hives, Gerard, <laughs> Ohio, 414. Brian, tell us about that swarm. You know, so I just had a, a just did an interview last week. And who I was interviewing, I, I was interviewing uh, Randy Oliver. Oh, and, that's cool. And when we're chatting, um, you know, it was brought up that, uh, very often, you know, the plan that you have, it, it just, you might as well not even make a plan. Just throw it out and just walk out into your apiary and more or less let the bees tell you what you need to do. And I go, uh, you know, Saturday after I had got those packages from you, um, <laughs> go over to my mom's then on Sunday and I figure out oh, this will be a quick thing, you know, dump them in and do a couple spot checks real quick and I walked up and said hello to my mom, chatted for a second and walked down into the apiary. And I just, before I even got out of the building to step down into that fenced area where all my, my colonies are, I heard the sound and I could look, you know, in the fenced area and I just seen them boiling out. And I thought, you gotta be kidding me. And they flew, they flew out about 75 feet, uh, the pine trees that are out front there. Yeah. and uh landed 35 to 45 or 40 feet up Ugh. i tried throwing like my mom has a wood pile down there and me being the idiot that i am i'm throwing logs up there trying to knock them down <laughs> and i ended up had one bee come down and tag me in the ear you know, <laughs> didn't didn't quite get me but just boom because i'm sure i thought I swarms were always heard. like gentle and calm, and you never have to wear anything in them. Are you sure? I don't sure? think they like to be chucking logs at them. <laughs> and I just, there was nothing I could do. I mean, it, it's the ground here was so wet that when I was walking down through my mom's yard, literally you heard the like squishing sound. There was so much water. And, you know, my mom was like, get a ladder. And I'm like, they no way, you know, I wasn't about to mess with them. And I went down then and was getting my camera and stuff ready, you know, getting stuff set out to do the packages. And within 20 or so minutes, maybe 30 minutes, I heard the sound again and they all took off and went somewhere into the woods that are, you know, that's behind her place. So they're probably in a tree, 
you know, somewhere in the acres behind her. So, <laughs> wow, we'll figure. You know, and the interesting thing, though, and I need to um, check with them. It was the colony that I had the BDAR on from the eclipse, that broodminder sensor, and I hadn't taken it off yet. So I'm just curious what that would show. I'd like to see what the data is as far as like regular traffic. And then when that massive of a swarm took off, what that data shows, you know, because the outbound traffic would have just been through the roof. So what can you do though? You know, swarms are the kind of thing that happens. And, you know, there's that, there's this like almost a fight or flight thing that happens uh, when you're right in the middle of it, or if you had, you know, kind of see it, Bruce, uh, how many swarms have you dealt with this year? Um, I think I've physically caught uh, one, two, four or five, but I've had a couple more that have moved into boxes that I had. I usually will have a box or two sitting around at least some of my bee yards and, and they just end up with swarms in them sometimes, sometimes they don't. So I've probably caught at least two or three that way. Um, I just had one yesterday I caught and Brian, I don't know if you can, I sent you a picture of, sent you a picture of some from Brian Lee and then uh, that the he caught that he caught in swarm traps yesterday. And then one I caught yesterday actually um, on the bottom of his cell uh, of a uh, satellite dish. And that was a interesting endeavor. The queen, you know how it's got the bracket on the back and there's a space there. I'm convinced now that the queen was in that bracket because I kept pulling bees oh. off and I, I couldn't get to her. So finally, and we may want to talk, I don't know if we're going to talk about strategies for getting catching swarms here in a little bit. Some of them are more difficult than others. Uh, most of the ones I've caught this year, I caught one that I just kind of held some frames up to it. They ran on the frame, ran it, stuck them in the box, and, you know, I ended up catching them that way. Caught a couple that way. Some that were hanging out on the bottom of a, just on a little tree down on the ground. I set the box right next to them, and they just ran right in. And then that darn thing. And then one I used a bucket up in a tree, and then the one yesterday, they just were so stubborn. They did not want to go in the box. And I finally did catch the queen, um, and she's, and I'll, I'll show you kind of, how, it's an interesting uh, situation here. Yeah, that's the swarm I caught yesterday on the back of a satellite dish, probably about the size of a volleyball. It wasn't huge, but it wasn't, it was a nice swarm for the, this area. Mm. But I ended up catching the queen. I'm going to do a video on it. I think I got some pretty good footage of it. Didn't have my fancy mic or anything, but I think the footage will be pretty cool. But I caught the, I found the queen. That's the only one I got him in the box. I think she was hiding it behind that bracket underneath there. Like there's a space and I was grabbing him with my hand, trying to brush him out. That's Brian Lee. Uh, Brian caught those swarms. Uh, there's one. I think they're the same swarm just from different angles. That's a swarm trap he has. So, hey, Brian, put in the comments. Is that at your house? I see your house up in Birmingham, I think. I see the house in the background. So wow. uh, he caught that swarm up there on a tree. But anyway, I put the queen in a, in a little, just a regular standard queen cage. I didn't have a clip. I didn't have a clip. I didn't use a clip. I just used a regular standard plastic cage here and uh, had her in the hive. All the bees eventually moved in. And here's the cage. I'm not sure how well you can see this, but by this afternoon, I called him yesterday evening. By this afternoon, they had sealed this thing up. The queen was in it. That's the, that's, I had it laying on the bottom in there and I only have one frame in there. That's all I have with me. But um, if you can see, they waxed that thing up. They sealed all the openings. Oh, wow. And then on the back side, that was down she could get some air but it wouldn't have been much longer if they could have gotten under there would sealed the whole thing up so i'm glad i checked him today and, and got her released in there but uh anyway it's amazing they've already started building wax all i had was a frame that had a tiny bit of wax drawn out on it. that's all i have with me and today they've already started putting some white wax in there and starting to draw that frame out and then i added uh, five more frames today i need to get one more in there but um you know swarms are highly motivated it's almost miraculous what they can do uh, we put some food on them this morning, just some uh, sugar water on them uh, before work. My wife actually put it out there for me. Uh, just this Appy May Hive, which on a little bit of a tangent here, the easiest way to catch, the easiest, I think, box to catch a swarm in, if you're going to just catch a bee box, is the darn Appy Mays. They are so easy just to get them to go in there, and then you can just close them up, seal them up, and take them, and, you know, you don't have to worry about it. It's just, it's just really easy. It works really well, so... I've kind of, I kind of have gotten to the point where I've got three seven frame Appy May colonies or Appy May hives, and I'm, I'm trying to get to the point where I keep one in my truck all the time during swarm season because man, they're just, 
so easy to catch swarms in because they seal up so nice. But anyway, that's what I did. So, um, but I think I've caught a total of, like I say, two or three just in random hives sitting around that I set up as swarm traps. And then uh, I think I've actually physically caught five, if I'm not mistaken, um, possibly six, but five just around the bee yards. Or that one yesterday was actually a swarm. I've had two swarm calls. I think I've caught three, maybe four actually in the bee yards where I just caught them. And I've had a couple that were just too high. I couldn't get to them. Um, you know, one of them still an open air call. And his very first one of the season is still up there in a tree. Last time I was in Slocum, about 30 feet up. They're still hanging out up there. Just, I guess that's an open air colony. So it's a fun time of year to be a beekeeper right now. Um, it can be frustrating if you worry about your bees swarming. If, if uh, I just, sometimes they just swarm. I can't help it. I mean, I try, but uh, you got to just realize it's part of the natural uh, sequence of things you do all you can and then hope they stay in the box. And if they swarm, just got a pretty darn good chance of having a nice new little queen in there that they decide to make themselves. So in the long run, whether or not you catch the swarm, Odds are I've got a new queen that's going to be motivated and they're going to just rock and roll and keep on going. Bruce, mm -hmm. when was the uh, last swarm you caught? Yesterday afternoon. That's when I caught this so one. You're, no, you're still in the thick of, oh, that's right, yeah. So you're yeah, still we're still the catching them. Yeah, we're, the, typically this year has been real swarmy, I think, a real swarmy season. I think a lot of people are having issues. And I, I've got several colonies I've, got, I've gone through that I see those those swarm cells that have emerged i know they've swarmed and you can you know there's a queen in there maybe not made it yet but i've had a few i go through and you just see those cells and you're like well i guess i missed that one but you just hope they're making a new queen and most of the time they are but typically around here we start seeing our swarms around the first week in march and by the end of march through april it's just gangbusters with swarms typically and then it begins to slow down a little bit in may and uh, by the time you get into june july there's there's very few so our swarm season, but this year, I think the first one I saw, I can't remember the date, but it was early, early to mid February. Every once in a while, you'll see one in February. And that one that's up in that open air colony, I think it was probably mid, early to mid February, maybe late February sometime. So this year has been a, it's been a really, so far, knock on some wood here. It's been a fun year. And so far, it's looking really good down here. And, you know, in an ideal situation with all the nectar and, and the weather and everything, I think the bees, tend to swarm more in the spring because everything is ideal for them to do that you know everything is just setting up for success that's kind of my opinion i could be wrong on that that's kind of how i feel about it so no i think you're right that's in most parts of the country you know it's it's interesting like you can you know you watch the hummingbirds coming north and you start to get an idea of swarm and bee season and then you get a couple of really heavy severe storms that kind of throw warm and cold air colliding and rain and to see how the plants and the trees and everything re and the animals react to that's pretty interesting uh so we had uh, our first swarm april 14th and brian april 14th let's, let's see let me look at the calendar uh i i see. can't i can't no mine was it. actually yeah mine, mine was the um mine was the 16th i can't ever remember mm -hmm. there being like swarms this far up north in ohio i mean that in a sense that's the second week of april you actually beat me by a couple days and there was actually somebody who reported on the facebook group uh, a swarm like last month so who knows what what kind of a, of a freaky occurrence that was now mm -hmm. we might have i know we've probably hinted at that before uh, but I knew a beekeeping couple who had swarms that uh, they they caught them in February the year prior, at late February, and um, made a bunch of splits off of that. And then the following year, you know what those bees did? Everything off of that genetic line swarmed early, and they lost an enormous amount of colonies that were swarming oh. like late February, early March, which is just, what? That doesn't even make any kind of sense. Why would bees do that? Well... I think there was something going in. I don't. I don't even want to get into that. Um, but uh, what's what's so? T I'll, I'll, sh I'll quickly share our first swarm story, and then we'll uh, kind of move on and share uh, what that looks like, uh, kind of across the country. But uh, we had uh, uh, a Connex box being delivered, and, and the guy dropped off the, the shipping container. And I'm I'm writing the check, and I'm handing him the check, and at the same time, the kids are saying, "Dad, look! It looks like a bee tornado." 
And I'm thinking, well, maybe it's just orientation flights they're talking about because, you know, we're looking out at the learning yard and there's a lot of orientations flight, uh, orientation flights going on. And, and it was Lily, Lily, eight-year-old Lily. And she said, Dad, look, it looks like a bee tornado. And then all of a sudden I heard it and, just, and had that you know yeah. cyclone thing going on. Well, it, it came out of the colony that is, um, you know, if you were here for the creator convergence or you've been out here to the learning yard, where the sawmill is set up, there's a, a cant log there. It's, you know, squared up log that's sitting right there. And there's a colony sitting right on that. Well, those were the rascals that were the very first thing to swarm here. And they were our own colony. And I'm thinking, what in the world? Now, it's one of the few colonies that I hadn't been in. Matter of fact, they hadn't even gotten any pollen patties or anything yet this year. So they're sitting there, they're swarming. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what's going on? And they're... Uh, if, if you've been to our place, that in, that soon-to-be Ant B Theater area, that's kind of where the learning yard is, that entire underneath of where all those overhead rafters and things are, that entire area was just a giant cloud of bees. And I'm thinking, that, that has got to be the 16th. Yesterday. Yeah, that was, it was so, the day we went to uh, – the day we went uh, – so yesterday we went to the Fairfield County Beekeepers Association, one of our favorite uh, bee clubs. Um, let's see. Let me pull that up here. Now, now I got to so know if, was, if it was the 14th or it was the 15th. Let me look here. When I was down on the 13th, remember it was there was that one other gentleman that you were out in the learning yard with, and I had walked over right before I was leaving. And remember looking up at that colony sitting up there, all the orientation flights yeah, and all that. Exactly, that's that's the exact colony. And it, it was it was Tuesday, so it was Tuesday the sixteenth, uh, and it was uh, wow. right about two o'clock in the afternoon. And so here there's, and I mean, you're, we're talking. I mean, gosh, if that was if those were packages of bees, that had to have been crazy. Twelve pounds of bees. I mean, it was enormous. I mean, it was just you look at it and your heart broke a little bit. Because you felt your, your you felt your wallet just get drained because that's a lot of bees. That was several you know several splits or so. Anyways, they and then they they group up into this giant ball, right? And they're just kind of they're cruising up over the hill. Uh, Brian, you've been to our place. You know where there's the there's the oil pump jack, and mm -hmm. then uh, to the right of there, as before the hill drops down into the valley, uh, there is what's um, our the our the VSH. Uh, Caucasian hybrid, the, the Appalachian mite maulers, that little yard of 12 that's right there. They flew right up over those and they just went up, up, up. And I had Jake watching them and Jake said, Dad, they didn't stop. They went all the way to the horizon. They didn't even look back. I was hoping they wow. would stop on oh, something man. along the way, but they, they didn't. They actually flew out of that colony. They gathered in the air above it and they went off as far as you could see. And we're talking like the tree line is a good, good, good piece yeah, of that's a little ways. Yeah. Wow. So anyways, they were but, but so we'll talk about that a little bit, you know, so what do you do in that kind of scenario when you, when you're in the middle of it, right. And you're seeing the bees leave, um, you know, let's talk about that a little bit and then we'll check in with some folks across the country, see um, where their swarms were. But, you know, when you first see that swarm gather, like they're getting ready to take off, you know, your first thing is like, Oh no, I fail. You know, what a failure. You know, I, I totally failed. Uh, and then and it happens and then they, they move on and it just, it, it's like a storm that moves in as soon as they're up and active and doing their thing, just about as soon as you're like, okay, then they're boop, they're just gone. And, and so before and other times I've actually been right in the, on the early side of it and I've seen them swarming out as they're all dumping out to collect and I've actually gotten in there and I found the queen and I was able to cage her or quickly move her. Uh, and then find where the virgins were either running or getting ready to hatch and split things out. I've also uh, put the queen back in there and close up the entrance so they can't go. They settle down in about an hour. Then I split everything out, move the queen, make a split, move her to a new area, knock everything down inside of that colony, uh, only leave one virgin running or one cell, and then move everything and just split everything else out. So one colony that's swarming, you know, it's a forced split. If you're lucky enough to catch it, because you can move the queen and a resource colony off into a new spot. And then what I do is split the tar out of whatever is left and, and only leave the very smallest, leanest split left 
in that same location and that's worked great and sometimes it, it works to your advantage uh, every year I try to do that with queens that I'm actually looking to breed from I let them get up to that point hopefully I'm in there before they're hitting the sky uh, and, and trying to gather for a swarm but I like to let them make uh, a bunch of those early queens off of the prime stock and then use that as seed stock for our genetics um, for our small breeding program but in this situation Tuesday these bees are all up in the air right so many I'm thinking there can't be anything left and there, there can't be anything left in this colony they've got to be wiped out and so they go off and I go through here and it overwintered um, in my favorite configuration which is a story and a half 110 frame deep 110 frame medium beautiful and going into the winter time they were just it was about, about the perfect size okay but the queen was made the early part of June, okay? So this was my very first one to leave out of the entire yard. And it was a queen that was made in early June. But here's what's interesting. We say it all the time, Bruce, there are no absolutes in beekeeping, right? You will hear a lot of things printed in books that will say a, it's, that this fact is gospel truth uh, and it can in no way, shape, or form ever be uh, contradicted or opposed. Well, typically, what we have found when we've gotten uh, just ahead of swarms, um, we, we, we usually have a little bit more time. Most of the genetics that we've worked with, as they've swarmed, there is a virgin running and then virgins hatching within 10 minutes, 20 minutes of a swarm when we've been in there. Now, most times we're able to get even when we're making splits and before they swarm you can look at those queen cells and see where they're kind of chewed out at the bottom they turn really dark and they kind of have that cardboardy fuzzy papery tip like like the, the the hours before they get ready to hatch and the mama queen is still in there and you have time to now split and move things well in this situation these bees swarmed with fresh cappings this is probably the first time in all of the there are probably thousands of splits and queens that we've made where a colony has actually left just as they capped the cell. And to me, that's a major problem because to me, that that's a colony that ordinarily every other colony, I would have probably had three or four more days. And I had the days lined up to go through, make sure everything was supered, check on cells. Everything else is more on a uniform time schedule, if you could call it that. So this one, for me, in my experience, swarmed a little bit earlier than a, than a lot of the other ones did but the wild card was the freaky warm day it went from 50 some degrees yeah. the day before mm -hmm. to 78 in full sun mm -hmm. and i think sometimes you have those weather events that trigger it ready or not here they come so you got to keep that in mind when you're into this part of the season you know all bets are nearly off when you go from uh, huge swings and temperature Mm -hmm. full flush of dandelions everywhere it's gorgeous i mean full flush of dandelions absolutely everywhere and the autumn olives were just starting to bloom so you talk about absolutely ideal weather the apples are in bloom everything else before that has already been the red buds are in bloom it's like beautiful prime weather for them to do it so what would you have done in that scenario bruce you've watched them they've clouded up they've gone you look inside the colony what's going through your mind bruce as you're kind of assessing the situation well <clears throat> it depends on how much time i have and what i want to do um most of the time like this just happened to me it's kind of crazy it was not this past weekend but the weekend before i was going through um some colonies there in midland city and while i was going through them a, a nice strong colony just a couple of hives down a couple of pallets away swarmed and uh, I caught the swarm in a on my seven frame mapping maze, and and it was a really nice, you know, down here the typical swarm. We see some really big ones, some really small ones, but the probably I would say the average size in my experience has been about a volleyball size, a little bit bigger. And this is a pretty typical. It's probably between that, between the two size, you know, about you know about that big or so. And I caught them, and I I just kind of I don't even think I went through the colony. I kind of cracked the lid. I didn't really go through it. I, it's a good idea, I think, if you can, like you say, Greg, to kind of pull some of those cells. You can use those cells. If they haven't emerged yet, you can use those cells to make splits with. You can make a split out of that colony. 
Um, but lots of times I just kind of leave them alone and I let them do their thing. And, and I, the interesting thing is there are times when I go to the bee yard and I see a swarm hanging in the tree or when I used to put traps out, I haven't done that a lot, but I'd have a, I have bees in a trap that probably were my bees. Honestly, if they're 15 yards from my colonies, I got bees in there. It's a good, I, good chance they're my bees. And so, um, but I can go through the colonies and sometimes I can't even tell which one swarm they were so strong, if that makes sense. You know, I'm just like, what the heck? I mean, you know, I've lost you know, four or five, three, four or five pounds of bees. And, and I can't even tell. Um, but usually you can tell either you see this, the evidence of the queen cells that have emerged. If you go a little bit later, um, you can see where they've emerged. And, and even if you don't see exit, you know, there's probably at least there's probably a virgin queen running around there, or you see the virgin queen or queens in there. And so, you know, you can always catch the queens. You can do, you know, you can do all kinds of things. I don't have a particular strategy I use. It really depends on the time I have and what I want to do. Um, I've just found that that in my experience, it seems like most bees, most hives that swarm, they don't skip a whole lot of a bead and they just continue to plow forward. Every once in a while you have one, I guess a bunch of the virgins emerge uh, simultaneously or something where they'll just swarm and swarm and swarm and swarm. You get those, uh, those cast swarms that may have multiple queens in and multiple virgin queens in there. And they may throw several of those. If that happens, the colony can literally swarm out or you just don't have any bees left hardly. And that that is obviously going to destroy your honey crop. It's going to possibly destroy the colony, especially if it's a little bit of a later swarm. Um, but I don't always fool with them much. I, lots of times I don't have time to go through all the colonies and figure out which one it is. But if I see the colony, sometimes I'll go in there and mess with them. And sometimes I'll just leave them alone and let them do their thing. I think I ended up just stacking honey boxes on that one that swarmed a couple of weekends ago and just moved on. I had a lot of things to do. Didn't really have the time or the opportunity to really go out and try to make splits didn't have the equipment to do that. I wasn't prepared really to do that that day. I was away from my home bee yard there. I was away from the bar, you know, a few miles away. And so, you know, I don't have a particular strategy, Greg. I I probably should, if I was a better beekeeper, I probably would, (laughs) but I do different things, you know, and, and, uh, somehow it works. Somehow it works out for me. Well, I don't think you have to necessarily have a specific strategy strategy. for it, but, but sometimes, you know, you feel like you're like I felt like I was caught by the short hairs. I got a guy here who's waiting yeah. on the check, and the kids are saying this, and I've got you know I have no idea what's going on. So I'm trying yeah. to get that taken care of. Go over, check it, see what was going on, and then when you go to get into it, you, know, you could either a just leave it alone completely, um, or you could dig in and get a picture. I like to dig in and get a picture. Yeah. We'll talk about that in a minute. But Brian, you're at you're at the you're at your own yard. And you just saw a massive cloud that just humbled you because you know you just lost five splits that Um, just left. What do you do next? So if with that colony there, I didn't touch it because that was one of the VSH colonies. Uh, So for me to go in there and distribute out cells from a colony that I'm already going to take care of. I didn't want to even mess with it because I don't want to spread those genetics. Right. So the only thing that I did was I knelt down in the front of the thing. I turned my little queen right dial to swarm (laughs) and I walked away from it. Wait a minute. Are you sure the queen white dial wasn't on swarm to start with? It's kind of like when you're driving down the road and you see like a deer crossing sign and you're thinking, what knucklehead thought it was a good idea to put a deer crossing sign right here and have all the deer know to just cross right here? (laughs) I mean, don't you hate when that happens? Is that that what you did is you you put it on Uh, swarm ahead of time? (laughs) Tell them to do that. (laughs) I'll say too, you know, in your situation, Greg, I, I don't, it's kind of fun in a way for me if they swarm and I can catch them right there. But in your case, where they went right over the trees, that is that is frustrating, especially if it's a colony you really you really love and you like, and you're like, man, there goes yep. my awesome queen that I love so much, and dang, I wish I would have gotten in here and taken care of issues sooner and prevented that from happening. So, but Brian, I'll, it'll be interesting to see if if you're willing to just kind of let them do their thing and see if the attitude improves a little bit in, a, in that colony with the second generation. Mm-hmm. If they're mating mating with with the drones from the the bees that are around there, maybe. It'll be interesting to see what happens with that, with that, uh, Look at how big with, that is. with the bees that are left behind. It looks like a shotgun, shotgun attempt there. 
Hey, Brian, pull up that picture of if you could. I mean, you look at that. Oh, yeah. There's no way. That yeah, was way up there. That's, I've had a few of those this year. If I was heartbroken over that one, I think I would have I would have attempted. And maybe I would love yeah. for the opportunity to try it. And I think maybe I'll keep one handy. I, I'd like to try some tanging and see if I can if I can draw oh, one in. There's no on thing. A, on the box. Mm. I have actually experienced tanging. I've actually seen it work. And I've also seen it where they just ignored me. But I, we had a, I was at a, at a friend's house, um, and while we were there, the bee started to swarm, and I got out the hive tool, and I had something metal. I can't remember what, exactly what it was. Maybe it was just too hot. But I was just banging something together, and um, literally those bees were going up in the air, and they just stopped and landed on a limb just right there, just literally within just a few feet of where they were. It was the craziest thing because they, you know, they were just swirling around and going up higher and higher, and they were within a catchable distance, and it was very easy to catch them. So... I've seen it where the, it's just so crazy how they almost like they stop and they just land first thing they find. But then again, I've also tried it and they just, if they're too high up or whatever, it doesn't seem to, so if you're pretty close to them, it seems like it may work a little better. But if you catch them while they're already in process, if you catch them kind of after they've already kind of decided where to, where to go, it doesn't always work. I don't know if it always works anyway, but. I should have um, tried that. The sawmill is right there. There's always yeah, some land somewhere to wrap the, to, I Gosh. But that's a good idea. It doesn't hurt. I mean, why not give well, it a shot? Here's, here's, you know, the one that got away. That's what Brian, look at that. Oh gosh. Yeah. That's, uh, the queen would be Lee. inside of that connex corner. Lee sent me that. Oh, Lee did? oh my yeah. gosh. Wow. It looks like that was about it as fun to catch as the one I have. Yeah. I, that looks like that's about as fun as the one to catch on the back of the dish. That was. So let me, let me tell you guys what I did with this one. And then uh, we'll check in with some folks across the country. So this thing is going, and it's it's going. And like I said, it went it it went to the horizon. It, it went it actually went straight east. You know where it went? It headed towards the old farm. What I should go <laughs> go over there to that ridge, uh, and see if they landed in the, one of the bee trees that are left. Um, or no no actually I took the bee tree out and we cut it up. So the bee tree is art. That's actually here now. But I know there's a couple of hive bodies laying around somewhere there. I ought to see if they ended up there. But here's here's okay. This is this is going to sound ridiculous, um, but that's okay. I've got thick skin and I've got broad shoulders. Um, so here's what I did. Wrote them off. Okay, great. What I like to do in that situation is I like to now. Now we're talking about uh, risk assessment. Risk mitigation is the name of the game, or actually loss mitigation. So. The colony, boom, fine. There's a queen. There's a bazillion pounds of bees. They're gone. I'm not going to cry about it. Now I, now the mode I go into immediately is, okay, how can I mitigate any further loss? I want to get inside this colony, and I want to see what is going on. I want to know, are there virgins running? Are there multiple virgins running? Are there queen cells? Now, sometimes you'll have false swarms, and a lot of them will go out and leave, They'll fly around, and all of a sudden, as, as fast as they do that, they fly right back into the box because mama didn't go with them. And they're thinking, what are you doing? We were, we were ready for you. Come on, mom. So I've seen that, and I've actually stopped that dead in its tracks before. So in this situation, first thing I'm doing is, okay, that definitely looks like they're not coming back. Let's go inside. Let's see what's left. Guys, I open this box. I wish I had a video. I opened the box and I took a double take, like Bruce said earlier. Did I just see a swarm leave this box? Because this box is boiling over with bees still. How is that even possible? And I'm looking in this box and I mean, it is a story and a half that is so fat. If I had missed that, I would have opened it up and I would have said, oh my, these rascals need split. All right. So it's a story and a half. The top box is loaded full of brood and honey okay so i'm going through and there's like four or five queen cells in that box no virgin nobody running around and they're just a hair irritable like they're they're just they're off they're just yeah it wasn't like when when, when lisa uh, gown was up and we're full with swarms and it's this and that it's like they're relaxed these were just a little edgy just a little a little off and I'm going through and they're, they're starting to kind of pelt my hands a little bit. And I'm thinking, what are you guys doing? I mean, I get it. You've had a 
you've had a pretty eventful afternoon already, but so I'm going through, right? And smoke is, you know, they're calming down a little bit. I'm going through and I get into the bottom box and there's like four or five more. But what these bees did is they just, they just chimneyed vertically right in the center of the 10 frame box, right into the, the, the medium box above. And then everything on either side was food. So I'm going through, there's no virgins, but what I'm looking for, I'm not looking for the virgin. I'm looking for the evidence of a hatched virgin. I'm looking for a ripe cell that was just emerged trap door open or one that was emerged last night or sometime in, in the recent future, nothing. All I see is pristine, clean, freshly capped cells. And then here's what cued me into something's was just a hair off. There were open cells that were a day away from being capped. I'm thinking this timeline is just goofy. What in the world hmm. is going on? They're like, I get it. They're out of room. And there was a ton of bees in there and we had a, a, a spike in temperature, right? And I think they were getting so hot, it must be. But here's the thing, there was some little mitigation things already in place. Uh, that particular colony, oh no, that colony, that, that colony was a solid bottom board. Yeah, so they were getting hot. You know, I, I'm thinking they were hot, overheated. Uh, we had a temperature spike. Had I known that, I could have probably stopped or slowed that down if I would have just cracked my migratory lid just enough to vent that would have probably slowed things down just a little bit anyways i'm going through there i'm finding all these queen cells the first thing you start to develop with with more rotations of something you start to develop muscle memory and i and habits good or bad so my immediately my first thought as i'm seeing these queen cells the old me goes oh my gosh all right here's nine splits Right. And then I'm, I'm quickly thinking, OK, where is some quick equipment? And just, you know, 30, 20 yards away is, you know, 60 gesture boxes with painted. They're all ready to go in case something happens. And I was thinking about going and asking the kids, hey, can you bring me some of those real quick? And as soon as I'm thinking about splitting them, this overwhelming sense goes, nope, not today. Leave them alone. Cut all the cells down. So I went through there and cut every single queen cell down. And why? Because, yeah, they could have just been hot and overheated. However, I don't want anything, I don't want any kind of genetic that may be on the early side of swarming at all in my genetic or any or potential genetic in Queens in the future. Before I fully know the whole story, that's what I'm looking at. That was the, the outliers are the ones that you kind of have to watch out for. When you, when you have outliers that are super, super hygienic or not hygienic at all or that bees that are falling on their face or ones that are just uber, uber good, you have to pay attention to those and determine, okay, does that fit into the breeding program or not? If they're super outliers, like, oh my gosh, they are, they're, we're finding no mites in here at all, but they can't get past a nuke size box every year, that's an outlier, they're gone. If they do a great job and they're keeping mites down on their own and they're producing a honey crop, and they overwinter and they're gentle and it's like a standout colony okay those outliers are worth considering for breeding in this case this outlier was this was the very first one to swarm and it was the very first in my area uh for me that i had heard had swarmed i'm thinking i don't know that i like that and then going in and finding that they swarmed five days premature than when i thought they probably would I'm thinking ah, five days, I'm always tight on time. Um, that's not gonna cut it. So I decided to cut all those cells down and here's what I did. Knocked all the cells down, gave them no future hope. I went and grabbed a double screen board and I put a double screen board between the deep and the medium. Just because, because there were so many bees, I didn't want to just shake them all out. What my goal is, and, what, and I hope they'll take a video this week because it'll be tomorrow where the next step comes in. I put a double screen board in with the entrance in the reverse direction as the, as the entrance on the bottom box. So that box kind of uh, empties out on its own. There was still some open brood up in that top box. There'll be some nurse bees that'll stay there. They'll stay put. If they make a queen cell, great. If the bottom one makes a queen cell, great. Tomorrow, I'm gonna go back into both boxes and I'm gonna knock down all the queen cells and empty out the rest of the bees that are in that top box and force them down in the bottom box. And guess what tomorrow is? Grafting day. 
there is no better cell starter, in my opinion, than a colony who already has that swarm tendency right there inside of them. That's what they're going to be really good at doing. So for me, I'll throw at least 45 graphs at them, possibly 90 tomorrow, because they are so fat. They are so thick. They are so juiced up. And one of the beautiful things about swarms is swarms get juiced up on nectar before they go. So we could potentially be looking at a colony who already has their nutrition squared away in advance of me wanting to drop cells in there. Could be one of the best takes of the year. So for me, I'm going to turn the frown upside down. Yeah, I lost a cloud of bees and a queen who was one of our early queens that we grafted last year. Great, they're gone. You know, we're going to spread the love out to somewhere else. But now we're going to turn it into a cell starter machine. And I'm going to get many rotations of queens out of this box. It's good and close. It's right there in the learning yard. It's going to be a fun opportunity to just see how many queens we can get out of that. We will have to freshen it up with some brood and things like that. But why not? Right? It's not a loss. It's actually a huge gain in a learning experience. So my goals are let's keep that genetic out of the mix. I don't like it. But let's 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 play to that tendency and let's graft the tar out of it. Mm -hmm. Have them make as many cells as we possibly can. And then when we when they start to run out and you're starting to get lower takes on it, great. We'll leave them one. They'll requeen, they'll go off. Perfect. But what's important to think about is so now I'm freaking out. I'm thinking, okay, how many more colonies here are getting ready to swarm? Right? That's all I'm thinking about. So I am I am like busting through colonies quickly, cracking them, looking them underneath. First you crack the lid. What's the population? Crack the next box. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. This one, might be, okay, you go through. Everything that had a solstice queen, they're like, okay, here's some fake cups. Drones are prolific, right? But there's no queen cells yet, right? Everything done in similar time frames. So what's, the, the, what's something to think about is in this case, it seems as though the solstice queens who overwintered and they were story and a half or double deeps, they're not ready to swarm. They're still putting a honey crop on, but they're cruising along at a little different clip. So that's what I did to turn the swarm, turn that frown upside down, and have it actually generate a lot of revenue. I like it. Smart. Yeah. Quick thinking. Bruce, you said, oh, I don't necessarily have a plan. That wasn't my plan. But you just start going through <laughs> the thing. Doop, doop, doop. And it's sequence, 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 sequence. Oh, okay, here's the move. Boom. No. Yeah, part of part no. of my situation is that I, you know, I'm so, I mean, we literally right now we're starting the honey crop. And so I just hate to, I hate to just bust down a product, what's going to be a production colony, but there's, everybody's got their own goals. And I think that's a great, I'll have to keep that in mind in the future. If, if I start do, trying to do more Queens and things, cause I think that's a great idea. I think that's what a lot of the queen breeders do is they look for those, those hives right when they're primed and ready to swarm. And, they convert those into the cell, cell starters and, and cell builders. And so I like that idea. That's a great idea. And why hey, Brian, not? Yeah. yeah. Hey, Brian, show, do you have that picture I sent you that with the weird, crazy swarm in the bee yard? The weird, crazy one? Yeah, I just sent you one. You'll see it when you see it. It looks weird. Anyway. Oh, it we looks can talk. like a... <laughs> I was... Uh, that? Yeah. Okay, well, that's, that's good enough. If you see that thing, I, I pulled up in the bee yard. I was back in my truck, and I may have even had my trailer. This has been a few weeks back, about two or three weeks ago, maybe four weeks ago. And uh, Is that a I bee just noticed, angel? I was, I was backing through a big cloud of bees. I'm like, what the heck? So I got out of the truck. I looked over to the, you know, over a little ways away from the truck, and there was this weird-looking swarm. It, looked, it was in that shape. Now, you can tell in that picture some of the bees are starting to go in the, in the nuke there, but – Man, it was the funkiest looking swarm, one of the funkiest looking swarms I've seen. And so all I did yeah. was I took that, I took that Apame, my my awesome swarm catching Apame, seven May, uh, seven frame Apame hive, and I set them right there beside it. And those jokers, you can see, they're just going right in. They just started going in, and and I caught it that way. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I didn't get a video of this uh, for the for I didn't I shot some video, but I haven't made a YouTube video out of it yet. But I believe there were some multiple queens in there. Lots of times, and you guys tell me if you find this to be the case, if you see just a weird looking swarm, a weird shape, something like this, or you got like different clusters all around, or 
they're on the ground. You got like three different clusters. Many times it's a multiple queen swarm. And uh, that's, I, I'm pretty sure that one was a multiple queen swarm. So I could have just tried to figure out what to do with the different queens and all this stuff. But what I've started doing is just letting them duke it out and figure it out. Because one thing I've noticed too with swarms, and folks can uh, tell me if you've seen this also in the comments here. It seems like the bees really almost choose one queen over all the rest. You know, you, if, you, if you take the queen, like if you got a swarm that has five queens in it, and you were to put them in cages and set them like within a couple of feet of each other, you know, close together, some of the queens, like no bees go to them. And other queens, you know, even if it's five virgin queens or whatever, which it usually would be multiple virgin queens, or maybe one mated queen and multiple virgin queens, in my experience, like, it's kind of like they choose a favorite. And so my question is, and, and Greg, you might, Greg and Brian may have some thoughts on this. Are all those queens even good, slash, quote unquote, viable queens? Or are the bees picking the one that's going to be the best queen? And it's just really interesting to see, to watch them duke it out, man. When you got four queens in a swarm, how on earth do they decide? I'm going to drop a video for the swarm I caught yesterday. And, and the interesting thing was one of the first things I noticed when I pulled up. And this is just since there's only the three of us here on this chat, I can tell you guys, I don't want to, everybody else needs to wait to watch the video, but I'm not going to tell everybody else. Just kidding. If you're in the comments, you get a little sneak peek of what happened, but I looked down and there's like a little, probably the size of a walnut cluster of bees, just maybe 15, 20 bees laying there on the ground. Um, so I, just a real small little cluster. I'm like, I bet there's a queen in there. Big clump, you know, up on the, on the back of the satellite dish, probably softball, or not softball, probably volleyball size plus, and uh but down on the ground there's like this little tiny cluster so what do i do i go down there and i start messing with them and sure enough they have balled a queen in there and she's basically dead i mean if she was moving at all it wasn't much she was she was on the process of dying out if not already dead and so wow. i don't know how they decide and the bees when i pulled up that swarm i noticed they were kind of like you said they're kind of flighty kind of agitated a little bit a lot of bees flying around and so I, it seems to me, I'm not sure if they were trying to decide which queen to follow. There were some dead bees on the ground, like they were duking it out, fighting it out a little bit. It's just interesting to me how they figure things out. I don't know how they figure out what mm -hmm. to do when they have multiple queens. But that's another thing that, you know, the books don't usually tell you that there can be like multiple queens in a swarm. They usually say the old queen takes half the bees right. and goes to her swarm and it's the mated queen. The other, queen. the other bees stay behind and they make a new queen and it, the first one that emerges kills all the other cells and man that is you know ideally that's what happens but that absolutely is not a hundred percent of the time by any stretch if it's not even close and uh no so i don't know what you guys think about that how that works and how they sort it out but i used to try and separate them out and figure things out and now i'm just like look y'all figure it out i mean i don't mm -hmm. know which queen you want to choose i'm not sure how you do this but mm -hmm. i just left that nuke box sitting there by that swarm by the time I left that evening, I think most of them were in there, but they were still trying to figure it out. And I came back, you know, whenever I came back down there the next time and the bees were in that box, they were all in there just doing their thing and they, they were going to work. And I just took that box and set it up there on a pallet. And as last time I was out there, they, uh, they were doing great. They're, they're doing well. So you just never know. Um, swarms are just kind of crazy. It's just kind of a cool thing, but kind of crazy yeah. also. You know, what was with, with that one that I've had so far, I was in that colony like seven days before, went through it mm -hmm. and literally looked at all the frames, you know, just to see if I saw like any signs of them moving towards the direction of wanting to swarm. And like I saw drone brood, um, I saw some cups. There was, there. I didn't even find a single charged cup. Yeah. And I, when, I, when I snap it in, man, it can happen fast. It's that's crazy. Why, like, and it was from a Saturday to, I guess, a Sunday. So, I mean, almost eight days. But the time timing, like I smashed all the practice cups that I saw. I literally scraped them all. And so they had no, you know, and I mean, I know they could build another little cup like that. But, but timing wise, that's the thing I was looking at. I'm like it's only been eight days. So mm -hmm. how are they pumping out a swarm this, this size, you know, totally. Are you saying there's no absolutes, Brian? Are, are you telling me that a, these bees aren't reading the same books where they're waiting for the exact moment in time 
when the first virgin uh, hatches, and as soon as she comes out, they say, okay, sayonara, and they go off and do their thing. That's I mean, the book they need to read. Right. That's the, and, and I'm, that's printed in so many places. And you read that and you're just thinking, you know, here is a book written by somebody who maybe has had one or two hives uh, uh, every year for two years uh, and has a PhD in something. And they're writing this book based on what they think they understand about honeybee yeah. biology, which never aligns with the actual practicality of beekeeping. How many times? No. The only time I've ever really found, don't, don't, here's, I'll say this. The times where I only find one queen in a swarm is where I've never found the queen in the swarm, but I've cat served the swarm. And as they have, once they stick and they're glued to the box and pollen's coming in and I go in and check, I only find one queen. Well, if there was more than one in there, what do you think happened? Yeah. You know, they but figured it out. out. They, yeah. fig they do. They somehow they figure it out because. You know, I've, I don't know that I've ever seen a swarm that just splits up into three different equal size swarms. Somehow they determine what they want. You know, one of the, I cannot remember, maybe you guys have seen these old, old videos, black and white videos of get beekeeping over in Europe. Have y'all ever seen those videos where they're it looks black and white? Haul, it's, it, where they're hauling the hives, the uh, skip hives, like they got little dogs, yeah. care, like with, it's so fun, it's so cool to watch. Like, they got this, the pipes they're using to smoke the bees with, these bee smoking pipes. But it was so interesting to me watching those. I watched those years ago. I need to pull them up again because they're extremely interesting. But um, they would have like 100, 200 skep hives sitting too deep underneath. They had like a little shelter. This is in Europe. It was many, many years ago. And uh, they would sit out there. The beekeeper would sit out there, and he had these like nets. And he would just, during swarm season, he would watch the bees, he would watch the hives. When they started to run out of the hive, he'd go and he'd attach that big net over the entrance of the hive. The swarm would swarm up into the net, and then he would just take it off. You know, he had it clipped somehow to that entrance, and he would catch what they called those prime swarms, which is what they are, right, with the, with the old uh, mated queens. But then another video, they have um, cast swarms or, or secondary swarms, and what they would do with those is, you know, those weren't as predictable, I guess. So they didn't sit out there and wait for those. That apparently was later in the year. But they would go up to the bee yard and they would see these big, huge swarms hanging in trees all around. They would just let them swarm. And then they would go, like, catch them in buckets. And they would they would go through those swarms and catch the little virgin queens out of there. And they would do something with the queens. I think they'd make splits with them or something. They'd throw yeah. them in a – they'd throw a bunch of those bees in a skip and then throw that little virgin queen in there. And that's how they start new colonies. And it looked to me, from what I could tell by watching those videos, is when they, they would sell those prime swarms um, to people. It looked like they would stack them on a truck or something and, or on whatever they used, a horse and buggy or whatever, and uh, sell those. But it looked to me like, if I remember right, they were using those um, those cast little virgin queens for their new splits. And so, you know, that, that's the thing. They Just watching those videos, that right there kind of taught me the principle of, hey, there's different kinds of swarms. They're not all the same. Prime swarms are different than secondary or cast swarms, and and bees they just do their thing, and and so, you know, I, I think people that write books, one of the reasons I think that people that write basic backyard beekeeping books, is so the beginner beekeeper can get an idea of general principles with bees. You know, ideal conditions, face the hive southeast. You know, make sure you got a windbreak. Um, prime swarm is this. Swarming means this. Eggs, larvae, breed, very basic stuff. Mm -hmm. And so that, that'll get you started. I mean, you can kind of have some general principles, but obviously the, the only way to really learn about bees is to, is to, you know, of course you can watch videos or whatever, but to actually get in the bees and, and watch them and learn to read the bees and what they're doing. And as you gain experience, you see a lot of things you never saw in the book or in the books. And, and uh, you just realize that I think books have their place and they're good for that purpose for basic introduction and to, to teach basic principles, which, there are basic principles that do apply with bees. There are some absolutes. Mm -hmm. For example, you have to have a queen in the hive for the hive to survive. I mean, things like that that are absolutes. The queen lays eggs and so forth. But when it comes to actual bee activity or, or bee, you know, the science or the art of beekeeping, there are so many nuances and variables. Mm -hmm. Weather, genetics, mm -hmm. type of hive body, you know, just so many different things as anyone, everyone knows that it just, it just can change so much from person to person. And of course, individual beekeeping, beekeeping goals. And so it really is just, it's just such a, such a fascinating um, opportunity to, to share with mother nature 
uh, is something pretty darn cool. And Tim's type order very close. Type of hive body. Oh boy, yeah. Brian, what are you doing now? Uh oh. Uh -oh. Kind of worms. Oh, he's the only uh -oh. reason why here. Hang on, I gotta I gotta make sure that. Uh, is this is, a is this a coper a coper skep? Okay, okay. Let me make sure that Chris is watching this. Chris Medeiros, he's got to be watching this. He was on earlier commenting. So, yeah, Chris oh, Medeiros, uh, thanks for uh, shooting people our way, looking uh -oh. for uh, queens uh -oh. and bees and stuff. Appreciate you, buddy. Thank you. <laughs> what in tar? The Copra Skep made its debut. What is it? The Copra Skep? It's the, it's the, yeah, it's the, the Hex Hive, but you see how big this thing is. Online, wow. they were saying like small and whatever. Look at this thing. That's like 80 pounds in filament. <laughs> It's mass, and this is just one layer. What's the R value on that puppy? Seventy-four. When when you go with a thicker infill on this, it's actually the R value is higher than wood. Right. So. Wow. <laughs> so it Brian. depends on on what hive body. Jason Crook, if you're watching this, your production man is uh, dedicating printers to. Copra skeps, not queen right dials. I need to have a talk with production here. <laughs> well, look at this. One of the coolest things we're going to the moon, folks. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the funnest things about swarms, if you really want to learn about a swarm and you see one, put a put a hive body down, put some drawn comb in there, put a sheet underneath of it, and shake the swarm out on the sheet, and watch what happens. Yeah. Nine times out of ten, you will see multiple queens, just like Bruce said. You'll see the, the primary mother queen. She there there can be virgins that tag right along with her. And just like I have seen it, the the swarm scenario when Lisa was up here that we caught is there was there was a mature, I mean a a massive gator tail uh queen. Of course, she was thinned out, she was long, uh, but she was a mature queen, bald as could be. Uh, and there was a just a, a gaggle, however big a gaggle is, a bunch, a bunch of bees around her, right? And then on on the same autumn olive in different little segments were just little tiny, one of them might have been a baseball, one might have been a football, one might have been a softball, and there was at least one virgin on each one of those, right? So it's pretty neat that they determine, you know, virgins have a love-hate relationship with virgin queens, is yes, they can be a valuable tool for you, um, but they're valuable, especially in that one to three day window. Unless you're inseminating, then of course you need a 10 day and there's things, other things that you do. But virgins can be a valuable tool um, if they're in that window and things are done correctly and they're decently and in order and all these things, right? But what's neat is when the colony is able to detect the difference between these virgins that all hatch within minutes and say, okay, uh, we're betting on this one or we go with that one. What would be really cool is I don't think we'll ever know, but can you imagine like the hive mind as this is going on and they, they are prepping for a split, right? They, they, they are prepping for, okay, well, sister, it was nice knowing you. Good luck in with the rest of good, good luck in your last seven days of life, wherever you swarm and wherever you're going with mom, hope all goes well. Thank you. See ya. And then they're, they're going through the a mindset. I'm imagining this, of course, um, they pick which one of these, new it's like their ant just hatched inside of this colony and one was like a minute older than the other or this right before they were fighting before there was no, no battle royale right and they're saying okay we're it's like politics we we're gonna go with any mini miny mo boom and boom and they go and they stick with that and they go on life or death it's really cool i would love to be able to just just get a glimpse of understanding of what is going through the colony's mind as they do that, as they make those decisions. You know, is it is it yeah. like Seely's honeybee democracy where this is a predestined thing and you go here, you go there? Is it already laid out ahead of time, or is it just like a you know, it is really cool, uh, really cool things. But I, anyways, I'll geek out on all the things that I little dumb things that I think about. But when you spend time in a thinking chair or just watching the bees, you you're you're just you're transported to a to a whole new world um, where everything that you know as reality doesn't exist, and so you're trying to to understand the the why and the how and all these different things. 
that we really can't other than to be completely enamored at the beauty of God's creation with these bugs in the box. And just, it's a reminder that if there is so much beauty and purpose and intent with the honeybees, how much more so for us? Just a little thing to think about. Um, pretty cool. Let's check in here with uh, with some folks uh, across the country uh, on uh, when, when swarms started there. And then we'll finish out with uh, some, some uh, questions and answers. Before we go on, I want to thank uh, Brian Coper. Thank you for the uh, stream team chat. Appreciate you, buddy. And I want to thank um, Phil at 33 Mile Bees for uh, becoming a YouTube member. And I also want to thank Amy Kobeka for also becoming a YouTube member. We appreciate you guys. All right, let's, um, we'll, we'll start with, uh, I've got favorites, you know, folks that are here in Ohio that I've seen. Uh, one of the guys that I really like, Randy Reed here, Trails in Farm, says, uh, Greg, I caught two more swarms the same day that I sent you the second picture. So uh, Randy had sent me uh, some photos of, let's see, I got to know when that is here. Let's see if I can I make sure I've got the right phone here. Let's see. That would have been, well, sorry, Randy, I, I can't, there's too many too many texts to sort through that one. I think it was just probably Monday, maybe, when that happened. So, um, and I think Randy is just a hair, Randy is just a little bit west of me, I think. So anyways, same same week here in Ohio. Uh, Brian Lee, Birmingham, Alabama, 416. We've got uh, Amber Ruiz, Norman, Oklahoma, February 28th was the first reported. Wow. wow. Isn't that crazy? That that's might take wild. the cake. That might be the grand winner. Uh, yeah, that's wild. February 28th. Our pals over at Sweet Harlan Honeybees, Harlan, Kentucky, April 10th. Three Boys Bees, Southeast Tennessee, April 10th. So that's about a week week ahead of us. Okay, that's that's interesting. Let's see here. We've got about 20 or 30 more. Uh, our, our pal, local pal, Dean Ghetto. Baltic, Ohio, two locals, two local swarms, 415. That's a popping right. week here in Ohio when it goes from 50s to all of a sudden 70s like that on the on the, the tail end of all these weather systems. That's pretty interesting. Uh, Jessica Fairfax, Montrose, Virginia, April 12th. Mr. Jonathan Bennett, Kabul, Missouri. Look at that. April 15th. I'm seeing a little pattern here. And I'm seeing that the bees are swarming on that storm front that went through. Let's see here. Cottonland Apiary, Darlington, South Carolina, April 2nd, caught three swarms. Our pal Keith Spillman, uh, he's had three. Shacktown, North Carolina, April 2nd, April 15th, April 16th. There's something to these storm systems that run through. It, barometric pressure, the hot, the cold air colliding something about that you know we were talking about tanging and getting bees that that percussive rhythmic uh frequency there's something to pressure and frequency and sound and all these things that are are triggering these i think if anyone is interested in tanging their bees just think of the Bee Gees. 220 beats per minute you know uh, brian you want to sing it no <laughs> staying alive staying alive uh, uh, uh. I can't sing that. Tang in your bees. Tang in your bees. Just yeah. like CPR. Just like it. There it is. Okay, enough of that. Uh, David Hunter, Dixon Springs, Tennessee, April 6th. Very kind bees, McGaysville, Virginia, wow. March 29th uh, and 415. Interesting. Really? Our pal Kenny Bach, Marietta, Ohio, April 1st. He's down there on the river. Uh, moved into one of his swarm traps, not from his hives. That's good. Wow. April 1st. Matt Kirkland, Houston, Texas, March 14th. John Lawler, Fairfield County, one of my favorite bee clubs in the state, uh, March 29th. He got contacted by somebody at a swarm. Matt, that's early, March 29th. Wow. Um, oh, cool. Another local. Uh, hey, Laura. Laura um, Mino, Hebron, Ohio. I mean, right next door, probably uh, 
maybe 15, 20 minutes just west of here, uh, April 15th, um, about five pounds right off the grass of someone's property. What a good find, Laura. Wow. 415, guys. So 15 and 14, 15, 16 seems to be a huge uh, swarm time um, here in the Ohio Valley area. Uh, Carol McCarthy Logsdon, Crawfordville, Indiana, March the 7th. JW Soapstone Farms, Honeybees, Olney, Illinois, April 8th. Chile, 8644, April 9th and 11th, White Marsh, wow. Maryland. I know we've had other swarms around my area because um, in the Lordstown, like uh, Village of Lordstown has a little uh, Facebook group. And there's one other beekeeper that um, a couple weeks ago, like he put, you know, just information about swarms. And uh, he messaged me and said when he like hits his cutoff that he'll let me know. He said usually a lot of people call him. He's an older, older guy. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they all hit him up and he sent a couple pictures of I think he's got four or five something like that in the last week or so. Oh my gosh. And he told me, he said, when he hits his cap, he'll let me know. And if I want any of them, so, you know, we'll, we'll see. I mean, I, I don't know about bringing in just any old genetics into my yard. Cause I want to, I want to try and own that in this year. So, well, that's a whole, that's a whole stream team chat right there. Bruce, you, what are you laughing at? You see, you see Grammy's comment right there. She prefers no. <laughs> When doing oh, CPR, oh gosh, another one bites the dust. Instead of instead of stay alive, another one. Uh, <laughs> dude, 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 look, look right here. This is uh, I, I went back and pulled up this picture from the original first form I caught. I don't know if you can see the date on there. Can y'all see that? February second. Uh oh. That was twenty. Of course, I don't want to. I mean, we're in the south here, but that was at two o three in the afternoon, February. That was the one that was so high. It's an open air colony right now, so first swarm right there. there. Looks like Bruce is Bruce is in the lead. But here. I'm Let's not I'm not trying to win anything. I just thought I'd say I didn't realize it was that early. I knew it was in February, but I guys, didn't know it was that early. realize the grand prize here tonight is a uh, a year long subscription for the Jelly of the Month Club. Bruce, you're in the <laughs> running. All right, let's see. Let's cruise through these. Russell Amon, March 23rd, Southwest Missouri. Our pal at Flower Street Farm Bees, Lakewood, Colorado, April 10th. Wow, that seems wow, that's early. that's crazy. That's awesome. Uh, that's what he says, way earlier than usual. Wow. Uh, before this year, 429 was his earliest. Wow. Jeez. 19 days. That's incredible. Big Brian Lee checking in, Tallahassee, Florida, March the 18th. Okay, let's see here. We got uh, Dan Weaver, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, April 17th. A large primary swarm boxed up right before the storm front. Ooh, great detail in that comment there, right before the storm front. And so interesting. I, I there think could there could be something to that. that. Yeah, there could be something to that, man. I've, mm -hmm. When you think about it, it could very well be true. I bet, and I tell you, from the, the storms that just ripped through this area here this evening, tomorrow it's going to be 70-some oh. degrees. I'll be out and about checking everything tomorrow and grafting and tomorrow. pulling from the donor hives, so I'm going to be on, like, full alert. Uh, Karen Kress from Be Amazing Hives from Suwickley, Pennsylvania. Suwickley, Pennsylvania, April 10th. Uh, JB, St. Louis, Missouri, April 10th. Wow. First, first swarm catch, queenless, put a cap cell. Oh, first swarm catch, queenless, put cap cell in or mated queen. Mm. Well, I think you could go either way. If, if you've got some open brood somewhere, you know, what I would do is just give them some a sheet of open brood and put some drawn comb on those rascals because they are worth their weight in gold just in drawn comb. Or uh, if you've got a really beautiful queen that you absolutely love, go rob you a frame of eggs, drop it in the swarm, let them make you five or six or seven queens off of the mother queen you love, cut those cells out and make some splits. There's always I a way to turn that frown upside down. I might, you know, if, if that's queenless, does that mean the queen got killed during the, the catch? Or does that mean that probably you just didn't see it? And I wonder, you know, if sometimes when you catch a swarm, the, it may be a virgin queen that's so small you might not see her. I mean, that's happened to me. Yep. I just, 
man, like you say, Greg, I think that's an awesome way to for insurance to put your frame of, of uh, open brood in there or, you know, eggs, young larvae, because that's an insurance policy. If you've got a little virgin queen in there, she's going to go ahead and get mated and that'll give them a head start. And um, they will absolutely, that'll lock them in. They, they, odds are they will not leave if they've got brood in there. Um, but if, if for whatever reason the queen did get killed or it truly was queenless, then it, it will allow them, like you said, to make some beautiful queen cells and end up with a really nice situation. So I found that's a little trick. Anytime you think you're queenless, man, just, you know, all the times I just leave them alone for a couple of weeks. But if you're worried about it, it never, ever, ever hurts to put a frame of open brood in there. Yep. You know, with some with some eggs and larvae, because mm-hmm. if they got a virgin running around, like I say, even if it's not a swarm colony, but if they got a little virgin running around there, it just gives them some strength. And you can absolutely fix that colony if they need, if they are truly queenless, they can absolutely fix themselves and you can end up with a nice queen. So just for whatever your beekeeping uh, each situation is, never hesitate if you've got it, got it available to put some open brood into a questionable colony that you're worried about being queenless. Um, absolutely because it if you're ever wondering what is going on with this colony drop your frame of eggs in there when i'm when i mean eggs if you've got day old eggs in there and that progression you'll have the right size larva so if it takes right. them a day to figure it out you'll still have a, a, a good material mm-hmm. for them to work with I'll I'll you absolutely. Them, absolutely. Tell you. and even if you don't do anything with it even if you just want to find out are they queenless or not throw it in there they'll tell you then you can you can pivot you can make a move and know when okay well doubt, hey, you're making sales when in doubt egg it out yep right there yeah, it is was- t-shirts <laughs> coffee cups tattoos you name it when in doubt egg it out egg it out stream team <laughs> slogan stream team slogan right there love it that's great Brian. you can tell too like within what greg two or three days you go back and look and oh, yeah. you, you'll know you can know then yeah. if you want if you're just worried about it Pull that yep. frame out and look and see if they're developing queen cells. You know you did the right thing. They're making queens. And if they if you don't see any, then they're most likely they're going to get that virgin queen that's in there that you didn't see made it, and they'll be fine. So it's yep. a great – that's just a great insurance strategy if you get worried about being queenless. I have people – you know, people contact me. They'll they'll message me, email me, whatever. Or, you know, if I'm trying to mentor or help somebody out. You know, I did the same thing when I was a new beekeeper. I would – I think I've told this story before. I would go buy queens from my mentor – I'm queenless. I'm queenless. What do I do? He said, Bruce, just wait. He didn't, I mean, he may have told me the egg, put a frame of brood in their strategy, but at the time I was a new beekeeper, I may not have had any really that I yeah. wanted to donate. But um, he would just say, Bruce, just wait, give it a week or two. And then, you know, then think about getting a queen. And almost all the time mm-hmm. they've got it figured out. But with in doubt, egg it out, Brian. If in oh, doubt, man, just stick I love that, there. Brian. I love it too, That's man. That's good. great. Gosh, yeah, Brian's all, Brian is Maybe that would be like our, our shirts for this year's uh, convergence. If Wait, we've... don't let John Turpin hear that, though. He's going to take that to a whole other level. John Turpin is the egg man, cuckoo, cuckoo. He's the guy that <laughs> runs around with eggs. And like, I, I didn't even know, I didn't even know, I hadn't met him before. And I'm walking around, and here's this guy, right? Big, handsome John Turpin is walking around, and he goes right up to me like we know each other and puts an egg in my shirt pocket. I'm thinking, that's mighty forward of you, but it's an egg. So thank you. I'm like, what? What? what do I give it back. And he did it again, and and it's it. So it's John Turpin, the egg man, cuckoo, cuckoo. I remember him out, doing that. It out. Yeah, he's using the term "egged it out." He's using it already, so we got egged it. it yeah, he's he jumped on it. it. When in doubt, egg it out. Uh, nice. Great, or uh, Brian, I think you've discovered Good. a new term there. I've never heard that man, before, but that's going like to be it's going to hit the beekeeping Good. airwaves, man. We'll have, to make a, we'll have to make a little, like, like little love video of this, a little short video. Yeah, granny, granny, yeah, Granny's got that quote, too. I mean, I've got a hive tool and a smoker, and I know how to use it. That that's a, that would be T-shirt worthy, too, right there. There it is. Awesome. We can say we, we knew Brian Wynn before the phrase went viral. He's going to be on the news, everything. He's going to be running for Congress, when in doubt, egg it out. That's uh, the title for these uh, art. Yeah. Check and see. We've got all oh, our pals, uh, Larry and Mary Ann Sears, Elizabeth, West Virginia, a few swarms around there. Uh, Amy Kobeka, thanks again for uh, joining as a member. Woodbridge, Virginia, yeah. April 10th. Uh, Rob B's Apiary, Columbus, Indiana, 416. I'm seeing a trend. Randy Reed, Trails End Farm. We t- we checked in on, on that one. That date was 
April 15th in Heath, Ohio, and he's just 20 minutes west, 20 miles west here. So uh, Laura and, and Randy are, are to the west. And Randy, I want to thank you again for the heads up on the storms. Randy sent me a text uh, before the tornadoes came through and just said, uh, storm with rotation inbound, heads up. So I appreciate that. Uh, let's see. Uh, Keith Spielman has a question here. Uh, and we'll get to or that'll be that'll be our first question in here uh, in just a minute. I want to thank uh, Dale, the Wisconsin beekeeper, for uh, that ten dollar super chat. Uh, guys, what I'd like to do is uh, transition the last uh, maybe 10, 15 minutes of tonight's chat uh, to kind of rapid fire uh, some questions. So if you have questions, if you would leave them all caps, and then uh, Brian and I maybe we can get those starred and get them kind of categorized, and we'll kind of uh, we'll go through there. Uh, and we can kind of check in on that. Uh, in the meantime, as you guys are, are leaving those comments before, uh, I want to thank everybody for, if we've been so busy, uh, we've already had two package runs, two huge package runs. I want to thank everyone for visiting with the farm. Brian came out and uh, picked up two. We've had folks traveling from New Jersey. We have folks coming from South Carolina, all over the country um, to support Nature's Image Farm, to buy their bees with us. And I can't tell you, of how much that means. We want to thank you from the bottom of our heart, the entire Burns family. Thank you guys so much. We've had a lot of traction and a lot of interest in our Endura Hive wax dip line of equipment. Five frame, eight frame, 10 frame. Uh, we carry the top notch, the best bee boxes on the market uh, made by Premier Bee Products, the Propola Hives, the Pure Hives. We're wax dipping those. Um, beautiful, beautiful opportunities. No paint, no rot, no hassle. We're really excited about that. I'm going to play this quick clip, and then we'll get to answering all your questions here. Stream Team Beekeeping Chat. Be right back. Hi, I'm Greg Burns, founder of Nature's Image Farm and Endura Hive Wax Dipped Equipment. Hey, as large family beekeepers, we saw a major need to do way better in protecting our investment with our beekeeping equipment from the elements for the long haul. So I coupled our practical beekeeping experience with our wood science background to create the Endura Hive wax dip line of beekeeping equipment. Our unique wax dip process expels water from the wood, replaces and impregnates it with our proprietary blend of micro crystalline wax, offering superior weather protection without the mess or expense of paint. Our equipment is protected from the weather inside and out, preventing box rot, fungal growth, and decomposition. That's a huge savings in both time and money. No more reworking tired, worn out boxes year after year. Our wax dipped equipment is proudly made in the USA. So protect your investment with Endura Hive wax dipped equipment. No paint, no rot, no hassle. Endura Hive, built to endure. All right, got some great, uh, great questions in. Let's get to those. Uh, if, if you're interested in uh, Propola or Hive Alive, 10% off Stream Team 10 at naturesimagefarm.com. Bruce, what you got there? That's a, uh, that's a Endura Hive Propola box right there. Oh, there you go. Nice. Can you see it? There it is. Anyway, I got bees in it, guys. That's awesome. And they're still alive as far as I know, so we're good. <laughs> awesome. Good to go. How, how's the Beautiful. hive beetle situation going for so you, So far, so far I have. I mean, I haven't seen hardly any hive beetles. It's the most bizarre thing. I've seen a few, right. but the overall right now we're just, you know, of course the colonies are big and strong, and and uh, honestly most of my colonies right now are kind of out in the sunlight, and, you know, and the bees are super busy and active and just, you know, hive beetles are pretty opportunistic, and they seem to attack and, and be more um, prevalent when the bees are a little bit weaker and the more difficult times of the year but right now i'm seeing very few hive beetles um i did go up to ozark uh oh what a week and a half ago and and there are some really strong the ones that are left there are still some strong colonies up there so there aren't very many left but the ones that are there are, are doing pretty well and and I, I mean it's not a horrible hive beetle situation i'm just not sure that was the most bizarre thing but we don't need to talk about that very long but overall 
hive beetles right now is is doing pretty well. I will say I did spread Grubex. I've put it in all my bee yards, you know, around all the colonies, and so maybe that's having an effect. I don't know, but I'm going to continue to I'm going to apply it again to all the, the colonies here pretty soon on the ground around the colonies, and I'm going to do that probably at least once, maybe even twice more this year. So I'm going to just I'm in attack mode, man. If I see hive beetles, we're just not going to play that game this year. I'm not going to wait. At least that's what I tell myself now. So we'll see how it goes. Bruce, I want to thank you uh, for the twenty dollars super chat. Appreciate all your uh, support over all these years. So, uh, so thanks for that. Let's get to our first question from the one and only Keith Spillman over at Half Tracks and Honeybees. Uh, make sure you check out uh, his YouTube channel, and maybe you'll get a glimpse at Big Bertha. It'll be well worth uh, the watch. And Keith, man, when I'm when I'm not running bees. Up through the Carolinas, and I, I can stop. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, uh, stop by and see you, and uh, see see Big Bertha, and would love to maybe go for a ride. So uh, Keith asks, uh, do you guys agree that a good flow shuts down much of the swarm impulse? Bruce, what do you think? You know, I'm not really sure. I right now we're having a, a pretty good flow here. The privet has just kicked in the last week, week and a half right in this area where I'm at. And, you know, I caught a swarm yesterday. So I do think that as I'm not sure what shuts the swarm impulse off, I do think that, that a really good flow does have an impact on that. For example, our swarms are mostly done usually by the end of April here. You do still have a few in May, but the privet, the, the spring flow is usually kind of a preliminary flow. And the big one is in May when the tallow hits. Um, it's just crazy. And I don't, hear of a lot of swarms during that time frame so it very well may have something to do with it i'm not sure i wonder too if possibly you know most of these colonies once they get things established once that primary queen uh, leaves and they have a new queen and they're happy with her i kind of wonder if that's what shuts the swarm impulse down as much as anything else once they decide upon a queen they want to keep or if they'll just keep swarming out you know until the flow starts i'm not sure what actually stops it but i do i do think it does have something to do with it brian what do you think you know i'm <sighs> timing so and this is just for my area when i, I don't think in just in my head i don't think it fully shuts it down just because early in the season like right now things are all starting to pop and you have literally, I mean, like you said, there's the dandelions and there's just, there's so much stuff out there right now. My last check in my colonies, I saw wet nectar. I had a swarm and we mm -hmm. haven't even gotten to all my other colonies yet. Now, um, whether I'm sure there's multiple factors that play into shutting down that, but, I, I don't think it's just, I don't think just a flow shuts down that, that impulse. I don't. Greg, I got a thought on that. Possibly, you know, early in the season, the bees are utilizing that food to make baby bees to grow. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if when they kind of get the population they need and want, and then the actual, the big strong flow mm -hmm. comes in, I kind of wonder if they kind of shift, if they go into storage mode, you know, once they've got their growth mode is, is kind of where it needs to be. Mm -hmm. I wonder if, if that has something to do with it. Once they kind of shift over to storage mode and they want to pack it in, and, and those foragers and the bees are just focused on storing it away, I wonder if that has something to do with it as well, if maybe that slows it down. And instead of growth, making new baby bees, yeah. exploding, expanding the population, and dividing the hive, now we got to store and pack this food away. I wonder if that has something to do with it. I really don't know, though. Yeah, I like that, Bruce. I think that that's, that's kind of what I was thinking, too, is right now as, as the, uh, the bees that were swarming – um, what I had seen is frames packed full of wet nectar. Um, and uh, we're not really, I mean, we're in a good flow. We're not in the flow flow, but we're in a, a pretty, the dandelions just started getting, get real heavy. And the autumn olive just bloomed really like yesterday where you can smell it. That real sweet, it's got a certain smell to it. So um, I think that could go either way. On, on colonies that uh, are a little more reserved on brood and they're brooding up on a flow, then I think they stay put.
But if they had already built up and they're able to get numbers and build up their brood nest um, on those earlier, you know, medium light to medium flows, I almost think the, the, the heavy flow is maybe helps trigger them because now everything at home is packed out quick. They gorge and boom, they go. Just a thought. So I think that could go either way. But like you mentioned, I think it's more uh, t timing of the brood nest and brood size, I think, is maybe one of the, the key components. But knowing, think about it, though. If I was going to pack up half the kids and uh, hit the Oregon Trail, it would be the most ideal time to do it as where I'm traveling, there is abundance on the trip, like natural abundance. So for yeah. me, if I was a swarm, and we got to be careful, the, the magic word, Brian, anthropomorphize, that, that was almost in a Fred Dunn cadence. You'd have to, you, you'd almost, you, you, would, you would almost see thumbs up. Oh, look at that. Oh my gosh. Brian, look at that. Wow. Bruce, Bruce gets nothing. Yeah, still can't. <laughs> Bruce gets nothing okay. on that. Anyways, I, I think maybe they would probably um, look at <laughs> Brian has all the. Okay, try it again, Bruce. Bruce, no, because you can get <laughs> Add to you, easy target there. Anyways, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I could think it could go either way. The hive mind in me says if we're going to leave home, we're going to do it when we've got food in abundance when we get there. Yeah. And once we get there, we've got enough food to kickstart and to draw wax and to do all the things. So mm -hmm. I don't know. It could go, maybe it could go either way. Yeah. There's some help, but if, but if you leave, out of questions. But if you leave in the middle of the hot flow, then it might run out by the time you get there. If you think about that journey, yeah. if the year's halfway over and you're yep. leaving, you know, by the end, by the time you get there, they're, you know, so th that's another thought. Maybe they try and get a head start on that flow. They know what's coming or they, something in nature gives them that cue. I don't know. That's just my thoughts on it. I think it's a little combination of everything. <laughs> Great question, Keith. I like the ones that make you think. Brian, what do you, what's going on, Brian? Brian's, what do you got? Uh, I got to, I got to put this. I can't see it. Back it up a little bit. When in doubt, egg, egg it out. out. Oh, gosh. Jeez. Just like that. <laughs> Brian leaves the like a grenade before the show's over. No, yeah. that, that was Lee. Oh, Lee. Awesome. <laughs> when in doubt, egg it out. I like I that. When Such doubt, an angle. Speaking of angle. eggs, this next question from N2D Sky. Oh, like N to the sky? Okay. See? I'm, I'm, I'm getting with it. Uh, no queen or eggs. Gave them a proper frame twice about a week apart. Still no queen cells. Now what? I'm thinking you could have a, you could have had a virgin running around number one, or I don't want to be a doom and gloom type, but if you all of a sudden get your hopes up because you start to see eggs, and a lot of them, and then you notice that those cells start to be a little bit more rounded out and a little higher. You'll see them draw the wax out just a little bit funky, like protrusions. You might start to see, uh-oh, maybe we have laying workers and it's nothing but drone brood. Sometimes when those bees get into that scenario inside of that colony where they're not going to, they even they may not even draw a queen cell because of the laying worker situation that's going on inside of there. I hope that that's not the case. Um, but if if you no queen or eggs, you give them a proper frame twice about a week apart. That's a two week time period. That's 14 days. If you had a virgin happen at the very beginning of this time frame, the if there was a standard accepted timeline, it's a right around 10 days that most folks say a queen will get mated. However, I'll be the first one to say that's not a fact. Because we see, we actually saw here that it took five weeks for a queen to have the per whatever circumstance that she needed to to get mated. We watched it, we witnessed it here. So, yep. Don't count your eggs before they hatch. But if they're not drawing queen cells, that tells me either a they're not queenless or b they already have their future predetermined. So, uh, mm -hmm. let us know in a week or so. Let us know next week. Comment. And let us know what you found um, this this coming week. Great, great question. I want to thank uh, JB for the five dollar super chat. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate that. 
Next question, Circle T Farm. Question for Bruce. <clears throat> Last video, you said you wait two to four weeks before extracting and look at the hives to determine where to put the excluder. What are you looking for? What determines where you put the excluder? Bruce? Okay. It's a great question. I can't remember which video that was. I'm, it was either the one I did with Yappy possibly, which by the way, if you haven't seen that, Yappy did a great job in that video. It's the one that dropped yesterday, but, or if it's one of my recent, I can't remember which video that was, but um, the way I do it is what I found is that, you know, you've heard the term a lot of people have that queen excluders can also be named honey excluders. And I used to go by that principle and I got tired of digging through frames when I was trying to harvest and making sure I didn't get brewed in with my honey that I was trying to harvest. So I'm trying to, you know, it takes just a pain to do that. So I decided to start trying to use uh, excluders. And I believe it was a guy here in our queen, in our bee club locally that, that said, hey, three weeks before you harvest honey, at least three weeks before you harvest honey, um, go through and determine which level, you know, where you want to harvest honey above and slap a queen scooter to make sure all the bees shake all the bees to make sure the queen's below but if you see her that's fine or if you shake the bees down that's fine too make sure the queen is below the excluder and then put the excluder above wherever you want that brood to be and uh then the bees the egg the larvae will hatch the the uh if you got eggs above there if you got any type of brood it will emerge given 21 days if they were eggs then of course it'll be you know the bees will emerge by then and uh, the bees will backfill that with honey. And so I just like to put the, the honey supers on there, the comb, whether it be comb or foundation, put it on there, whatever I want for my honey supers above the brood chamber, let the bees move up in there, let them, let them fill it up, start filling that up with honey, and, and then I'll shake the bees down. And so that's what determines it pretty much is what level I want my brood to, chamber to go up to, whether it's a deep, a deep and a medium, or double deeps. And then I put the, the queen excluder above that um, that's how I determine how much space needs to be below. And then everything above that becomes honey, honey supers. I prefer for there not to be brood in my honey supers. I think most people do. But every once in a while, that, that queen will get up there and start laying a little bit. Um, one thing you have to be careful of, too, when you do this technique is many times they'll put some of that drone brood up in those top, in that box, in that honey box. Sometimes they'll, especially if it's foundation, they may try to build some drones up there. And so you need to make sure those drones have a way to get out of there. If you, uh, you know, if you stick a queen excluder on there and then you seal everything up and they can't, there's no upper entrance or any way for those bees to get out of there, those drones will be trapped and, and one of two things will happen. Number one, they may try to get through that excluder and get their heads caught and just end up dying and, you know, a horrible death and they're trying to get through the excluder. Or number two, they're just trapped in there. So when you take that lid off, if they survive, you got hundreds of drones that come flying out of there. I've had that experience as well. But uh, I always try to leave some sort of an up here interest where there's a stick in the corner. But what I've started doing in recent years is moving at least one of the boxes forward. Um, usually it's the top box I'll move forward just enough, maybe a quarter inch to a half inch on the back. There's like a lip back there. And that does a couple things. It provides an upper entrance if the bees want to use that. It also provides good ventilation. I think the bees will defend that. I don't see a lot of bees usually going in and out of there. But they seem to love that. And if it's a box of stack like six supers high, you might want to do that a couple of times, maybe move one box back and then another box above forward a little bit. That works incredibly well. But that's what that's how I determine that. How many honey supers do I want to stack on there? And then I make sure I do it about three weeks ahead of the honey harvest. So all those quick bees will emerge and hopefully the bees will backfill that with honey up there. It works well. I like the bees to be working up there. If I just slap a queen scooter on there and then a honey super on there, many times the bees are hesitant to go through it. Some bees don't care. Some hives just go right up through there. But some colonies just seem super hesitant. They'll pack honey and get honey bound below sometimes before they go up above. And uh, I like to make sure the bees are up and working. If they are, get them up working and comfortable up there packing honey in, and that queen scooter doesn't slow them down, typically in my experience. Great answer, Bruce. To kind of piggyback on that, our pal uh, Chris, Drop Tine Farms, uh, Fairfield County Beekeeper. Uh, shout out to Chris and the folks there at the Fairfield County Beekeepers Association. Uh, Chris says a good flow can plug up a hive and increase the impulse for swarming. Uh, that's a great comment, Chris. Absolutely. So what, whether uh, uh, Bruce was talking about, you know, when to add the excluder, we were just talking about uh, swarming tendency on a swarm or on a honey flow. If, yeah, if they get plugged out, uh, pollen or nectar, and there's no room, 
those those jokers can hit the bricks and uh yep one way or the other uh, got hey, a quick, Gar- go ahead I'm sorry gary has a comment there and I, I don't know if he's this is where he's going with this but i i tend to agree with him he says i can keep the queen out of my supers without using an excluder and i would say there are different techniques to do that um i think one is of course and gary if i'm wrong I'm sorry, or maybe you could leave a little comment down there as to how you do that. But I think one way people do that is they make sure there's a honey rim around the top of where the brood is. And then traditionally, typically the queen doesn't go above that honey rim above the top, you know, that dome. Uh, and so if you've got, if you got a super of honey on top of there, or if there's a nice dome above the brood, many times that queen won't go up into the honey supers. And you know, the bees will, they'll kind of hit the top and they start backfilling and they're keeping that queen pushing her down. Another thing that I've seen work is this is kind of what Tim Ives has done. I, what he used to do is he would say su- uh, he would say checkerboard supers and not frames. So he would put foundation above the brood and then your comb above that, your drawn comb. And the queen will typically not go above that foundation until they've drawn it out. Then she might. And so that's another way to put a barrier in there to kind of help keep her down below. Um, but she'll start laying in there. And so... <laughs> You got to keep moving that thing up and putting new foundation there if you want to do that. But Gary, I'm not sure if that's where you're going with that, but that will work typically. I have seen a queen in a honey production hive though on the lid before above the honey. I have seen that happen <laughs> before, but that's that's very very mm-hmm. rare. She normally doesn't do that. A little little hot tip there. I have gotten into habit uh, over the last few years, and I can't break the habit. Um, and then when you don't do it, you're thinking, oh, I just made a mistake. Every single colony, when I'm, especially when I'm working four ways, uh, I hope to get more videos out of, of actually getting into work in the bees this year. Uh, the ones that I've, I've, I've suffered through this, um, uh, letting perfection be the enemy of good. And so if I'm not able to get the big cameras out, I'm not, I don't have the lenses and all the mics and someone to help me film it, then I just let myself be too busy with the bee work and then not actually do any of it. But recently I've been trying to just take my iPhone quickly out grab some quick video just so we can share what's going on. And I hope you guys are finding value in that and and hope you're enjoying those. I'm trying to like, let it go uh, and compromise where um, I'm trying to get at least help folks understand where we're coming from, who we are, what the, what we're seeing um, and, and get that part of the journey out and not be so focused on uh, precision and the detail and things like that. It's really hard for me to, to do that. Because I, there's nothing more than I love is to be able to take something and tell a story and add the, the add the, the shots and the transitions and the music and have something to tell a story and have an impact and have meaning and all the and purpose. But it's prevented me from getting basic stuff out, and so I'm gonna you're gonna see a lot more of just the basics, quick quickly shot. Um, I don't want to say poorly edited because I don't want it to sound like if that's the way that you edit that it's poor. I'm just, it, it's going to be raw, raw, nearly uncut. Uh, I hope you guys find value in that. Uh, if you would, we just, I just released one earlier uh, today uh, and we're just trying to get caught up on some of these videos. You're going to see, we're going to get caught up here real soon uh, and you're going to see a lot more on what's going on, especially as we kind of follow um, what happened when uh, I thought it was a good idea to bring in these VSH virgins, open mate them uh, kind of hybridize those with our, our Caucasian carny line. Was that a good idea? Was that a bad idea? What are we looking at? It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be really exciting. Uh, and we're going to be sharing a lot more of that um, as the season unfolds too. So hang in there, stick with us uh, as those videos uh, kind of uh, roll out. But uh, let's get through a couple more uh, questions here. Uh, Karen Kress, uh, Greg, things happening early. Nukes running on schedule or planning sooner delivery be amazing hives dave here uh, i have an order in uh, from you well dave from uh, be amazing hives thank you for your order we really appreciate that uh, as far as nukes go um it, it's it's too early to tell um, i've actually held myself back um, a little bit this year um, i could have started grafting three weeks ago we've had drones running and a lot of them uh, but i've actually held myself back and i'm trying to be a little more um, in the past, I have somehow caught myself in this race with myself. Uh, and uh, it doesn't necessarily a good thing where I was trying to see how was the earliest I can get, do this? What's the soonest I can do that? What is the, 
And, and what I found is I may have gotten a round off of Queens, um, but then weather broke at the wrong time and it really set me back. So I'm really glad that we've been a little bit more conservative on when we actually started grafting. We could have certainly, we could have had several hundred Queens at this point. However, with the rain events that we've had and the cold snaps that we've had, I am really glad that I'd listened to that voice on the inside and just held back on that um, because now it's full go. So now we are going to really get busy uh, making queens and the extended forecast looks perfect. So that being said, um, we are still on track for late May, early June, as long as so everything continues to go on track. Um, so. Is it going to be earlier? I don't think it's going to be any earlier than June 1st. We're kind of scheduling and planning out June 1st. It would be the first pickup for nukes. So Dave, uh, keep an eye out for an email like with all of our customers. We'll be in touch with you as we get a little bit closer. We'll get you updated. And of course, if you bought your bees with us, um, you will be getting emails real soon uh, with invitations to come out to the learning yard and be a part of this community. And we'll keep you up to date there uh, too. So, so thank you for that question. Uh, there's another uh, question here pertaining to uh, packages or nukes uh, from Catherine. When starting a package, is it good to feed them pollen patties as well as syrup? Brian, uh, you just uh, came down and got a couple packages. How'd your install go? And did you put pollen patties on as well as syrup? Went very smooth. Um, and uh, yeah, they have uh, the Pro Suite, so they've got the syrup on them. And they've got the, you know, just a small, I, I don't give them the whole entire pollen patty, but they get about, you know, a four by four square of it. Um, I want them to have uh, food right away. Um, it's a brand new colony. I don't want them to have to worry about going out and foraging. And then like they were installed, what, Sunday? And we've had rain two days since then. So if that happens and I'm trying to build that colony, um, they're just going to get delayed. So it's not going to hurt them. So I always, I always do that. Um, it, it tends to work out really well. Uh, but, you know, and then another thing just to keep in mind also, like when I install my packages, they always have, and I apologize for Eli there, but uh, they always have drawn comb. So when I install them, they're, they have food and they're always on drawn comb yeah that's awesome i think if uh great great points there we always recommend folks that you put a pollen patty on with syrup they've mm -hmm. got carbohydrates they've got protein uh, mm -hmm. especially with the hive alive pollen patties it's got 15 percent real usa pollen in it in my opinion it's the best pollen patty out there we've trialed and we'll get into that later we've trialed a bunch of them at the same time we'll share those results with you uh, but uh, we always recommend you put a pollen patty on and syrup. And what I like to do is make sure it, it, they're Hive Alive products because I want the thymol, the macronutrients. I want those things. I'm going to get their guts cleaned up. I'm going to get them ready to jump. Uh, and from, and but with a package, you never know what the weather's going to be. So exactly why we recommend folks do that, why we will do it if we're installing packages, Brian did just that. And it's for that reason. If you get rain, if you get cold, whatever reason, the bees are not going to be set back with their nutrition. You want them to be juiced up, happy, well-fed, so they can draw comb and they can jump. They can go now forage. They can draw comb. They can get everything ready at home. And we've just seen a tremendous uptick in overall hive health when they're well-fed and then and their nutrition is up to snuff. So great, great question there. Uh, we're going to take uh, one more question, but before we do, I want to thank Rob over at La Robbie's uh, for your uh, super chat. Rob says, thanks for all you guys do, Rob. We appreciate all the things that you and Lori and the whole team pop at La Robbie's uh, do to help keep uh, bees healthy and beekeepers happy. Uh, last question of the night and uh, from uh, Dale, the Wisconsin beekeeper. Uh, Dale asks, I have some old queens this year. When is a good time? to requeen. Now we were just up in Wausau, Wisconsin at Beak Meet 2024. What an awesome time that was. Brian's got a video out on it. Bruce has a video on it. I've got footage to put a video out as well. You can kind of check in and see how much fun we had up there. So hat tip and shout out to all the folks uh, up there in Wisconsin. Bruce, uh, Dale has an old queen uh, or old queens. When is a good time of year to requeen? Bruce, what do you think? 
Man, I have the best success in the spring. I know, I know people say post solstice queens, but I think the most, God, it's just hard to, you know, it's hard for me to just kill a perfectly good queen, even if she's old and just replace her. So I, I rarely just take a perfectly good queen and, and replace her. If, if she starts to fail, if things aren't looking good, uh, if this brood is getting spotty or we're having issues with disease, then I may actually actively kill a queen like that. But personally, I have the best success requeening in the spring. And what one thing I do to, to that I think I think my overall average age of my queens is has typically gotten younger over the last few years. I've been more intentional. There's that word about it. Is I just do splits with cells um, and with young queens. I do I do quite a few splits in the spring, early spring. Uh, you know, I do kind of keep track or I try to keep the best I can uh, track of the queens. I try to mark them if I can. I've started doing that more the last two or three years. And then I can tell many times I can tell if it's a new queen or an old queen. For example, if I marked a queen last year with a red dot. dot, But. For the most part, if I if I have a queen that's got a red dot, I know she's from last year, right? But if I got a queen that doesn't, uh, then there's a good chance it's a newer queen, and so I can put the go ahead and put a green dot on her for this year. So I the the bees do a lot of requeening themselves, but I don't actively kill a lot of queens unless they're just not. If it's a really super, they got bad characteristics I don't want, I may do that. Um, but rarely do I just kill a perfectly beautiful queen, even if she's you know a little bit older. They seem to kind of replace themselves over time. Um, I know that, that a lot of people, like uh, a lot of commercial guys, replace every queen every year. I just haven't really done that uh, with any kind of regularity. So I don't know if I answered the question or not. Well, that you, you did because everyone's going to have a little different approach based <clears throat> on queen availability. Is that in your budget? Are you making your queens? Can you get a hold of cells? When's the right time to do that? Let's go over to Brian and Eli. Brian, when uh, when do you typically requeen? Oh man! <laughs> Last year I played around with uh, requeening more than what I typically had before. And, I'm not uh, laughing at you; laughing with you. I uh, I recall having a conversation sitting out, you know, in those new chairs that you have outside of the the new shop and uh discussing the columns that were there were days so right. you know um i normally what i would do is requeen earlier in the season um last year i attempted notice i'm saying attempted to requeen late in the season but i screwed it up so that was on me um but Prior to last year, I had always done any requeening that I needed earlier in the year. So that's just me. I think it depends. Uh, my if, if, if someone were to ask me that, I, we know we've talked about it ad nauseum. I'm not even sure what ad nauseum means or why I even said that. But anyways, if someone were to ask me, uh, I know we've, we've, we've talked about it a lot. Uh, it late requeening is a beautiful opportunity for a lot of reasons however it is not the same as requeening earlier in the year when you requeen on a flow early in the year i mean you can do no wrong you really it's just it's it's a lot it's it's easy but you also sacrifice uh, a lot of overall potential if you're running into queens who may have a tendency of swarming earlier on you um, uh, and if you still have some treating to do in your colony with products that may or may not be uh, harmful for the colony or the queens, requeening too earlier in the year, you've just spent 40 bucks on a queen, you pull your honey crop, you treat, and if something does happen to that queen for whatever reason, you know now you're looking at potentially having to put potentially another queen in there. Now, hopefully that never happens to you. What, what, I, what I like to do is let these colonies build up to where they nearly are swarming uh, on these flows. And if I need to thin them down, pull some brood out, checkerboard some foundation in just to hold them tight. In my mind, it makes more sense to, if you can, capture that honey flow, manage manage that swarm tendency, move material out, bring some fresh in to give them some space, 
capture the honey flow when you can, and then do your washes, find out if, if it's time to treat. And if it is, go ahead and treat. Now, you've already captured, financially, you've already captured the flow. So you, you have your income there. You're going to put your treatment on to make sure that your colony is staying healthy so it continues to be an asset. And if there is an issue and you smoke a queen or she just barely got through the flow and she's starting to get spotty, it is it maybe time to requeen? You're not going to sacrifice your yield. You're not going to sacrifice them swarming too soon. You can requeen later in the year. However, when you requeen later in the year, you've got to be on point. The main thing is you've got to make sure that they are fed up at least about a week prior to queening, during queening, and after. And that's where bucket feeders really shine because you can trickle feed ahead, you can trickle feed while you're requeening, and you can trickle feed afterwards. For me, bucket feeding and trickle feeding is something that we've done for a very long time. And because of that, it lends a lot of opportunities to stimulate brood rearing, but also keep a hive that could otherwise be a little cantankerous keeps it just evens that out some smooths that out when you get into july and august and september and you need to requeen during a dearth boy you have got some serious challenges ahead of you but if you can if you can if you can smooth out those edges with feed it really makes all the difference in the world so we're going to talk a lot more about this as the season unfolds don't be afraid to requeen late in the year but just know it's going to require a little bit more work however there's a huge payoff because you're going to have a queen that's going to go into the winter time fret way fresher than a may or a june queen she's going to winter really well when she comes out the following spring as they build up what we typically find like what we're finding right now and every other colony except for that early queen that's already swarmed on us no one's ready to swarm they're building up they're putting on a honey crop but they're, they're not in that mode of swarming yet for me that's a big deal so when you can couple capturing your early crop first the cash flow great put the treatment on and as a backup plan if you smoke a queen or hurt a colony you're going to go ahead and requeen anyways now you're requeening and the following year that hive is really truly an asset we're going to talk a lot more about that we'll get into it uh, but uh, just know that what works for bruce and brian and me there's going to be a lot of nuance surrounding that and i think we're going to unpack a lot of that as the season unfolds so you guys can make a good choice. What is right for you? Because it works for me or Bruce or Brian doesn't mean it may be a good fit for you. I want to thank Carol uh, McCarthy Logsdon. She says, uh, grateful for this community and all the great, great advice. Thanks for all you do. Uh, Carol, thank you uh, for that $20 super chat. Guys, let's go ahead and wrap it up. We're almost at two hours. We're already in 30 minute overtime. No matter what we do, we just keep, it's hard not to just get in there, but we can get lost in the weeds going any longer. Uh, Bruce, what's coming up for uh, you and Bruce's bees this next week? Well, I'm going to go, I'm going to try to go in uh, maybe uh, Friday and Saturday and just check on those cells that I put in the colonies um, and the splits, the new splits. I'm a little nervous about it to see if I've got queens. I'm either going to do that this week or next weekend. That will be Saturday will be three weekends ago. Um, when I put those queens in there, made those splits and dropped the queens in. So it's about time to put up or shut up. Um, briefly, though, I'd like to say that I had really actually quite good success with those early cells I placed, but I waited, honestly, four weeks to check back. They were such early splits with the cells, and I'm not sure, and I really don't care if it was the queens from the cells or queens that the bees made themselves. Either way, I've got some really nice queens now laying them up. And the video that's going to drop here in the next two or three days is going to show that in one of my BRs, kind of what happened there. Um, I would like for folks, if you get a chance to, uh, just a little uh, selfless or a little, uh, little plug here. Um, the Yappy and I had an interview a few days ago. The video dropped yesterday. It's on the channel. I think you'll enjoy it. You know, I kind of tried to talk to him about who Yappy is as a person, as a beekeeper, and some of his his uh, things he's doing. You know, Yappy's a real personality. He's got, he has a lot of fun with his videos. He's got videos that have, I think, 32, 33, 34 million views. Very successful in that respect, but he's, he's also a very solid uh, person and a very solid beekeeper. And we got, we talked pretty serious about some things and just kind of who is Yappy. So I think you'll enjoy watching that video if you go check it out. It's on my channel I uploaded yesterday. 
Uh, and then the next video coming out is going to be actually, I think I just mentioned the one where I went through and, and checked those cells. And I, I the, the theme of the, of the video is sometimes it just pays to be patient because I was patient and I had better success. Had I gone ahead at the two or three week mark and combined colonies or panicked, I would not have had near the results. I wouldn't have as many colonies right now because I would have messed some things up. So I, I just want you to watch the next video that drops. Um, I hope I can have a good thumbnail and title where people are watching because I think there's a really important concept that you're going to get out of it, hopefully. And then I did a, a video that I've been talking about for a while. I haven't even began to edit, edit it yet, but I went out a few days ago and I spent a quite amount, a pretty good amount of time at a bee yard trying to get across and share how I shoot my videos. So if there's anyone interested in that, that video should be coming down the pike pretty soon. I didn't know how to do it, but hopefully it'll turn out to be, maybe there'll be a tip or two that may help you if you're trying to shoot videos, whether it be beekeeping, any other type of project you may do, or really anything you do, any type of videography where you're trying to shoot the video for yourself. I just kind of did thought I'd do a video and show you how I do that. It's been in my mind for a long time and I've had several people ask questions about it and I've, I've mentioned it before and finally I shot the footage. So now we'll see if I can get it put together and it can make sense. But uh, that's pretty much what's coming up the next few weeks. And then of course, with the big flow we've got going now, the, one of the bigger spring flows we've had in a while, um, we're gonna be harvesting the honey or before too long. And so it'll probably be hopefully early to mid-May we'll be harvesting our first honey harvest for the year. So we are busy. Uh, like I asked Yappy there not, I said, Yappy, so you're busy, hon? He said, a little bit. And that's exactly how I feel. It's just real busy, but it's a super fun time of the year to be a beekeeper and, and to be involved with this community um, right here in this part of the country. Brian, what's up with uh, Brian Coper and Castle High as the coming week? Gosh, busy. Um, I got to scoot over tomorrow and just check on the, those packages. Um, I put I put them in uh, one of my resource hives, so one of the double nuke setups. Um, and my, my whole purpose for that is I'm going to use that just to supplement into my other colonies this year. Uh, help, you know, the production ones that I have. If one needs a little bit of a boost, I can easily just yank out a frame of brood and here you go. So it, it'll be nice having that, you know, plus having the buffer with the extra queens. Um, so I, I've got to check that tomorrow. Uh, I'm going out to the Trumbull County Beekeepers tomorrow night. Um, they have me uh, speaking for part of their meeting, so that'll be fun. Oh, cool. I, I enjoy, nice. Yeah, I enjoy that group. Um, and then after that, you know, I, I've got two videos edited. Uh <laughs> got a lot of stuff happening and it, it seems like the videos are just going to pile up so I, I need to start trickling those out or else i'm just going to get so behind um you know uh and i think that's it i just in the next week it's going to be make sure everything is set up so that when i do my splits it's not oh crap i need to go to the store and get anything it's I plan on stacking everything so that it's basically I'm just going to pick up the bottom board and carry that with the box out. I want to have literally everything set up and ready in the next few days. So you never know what's going to happen. Um, I just want to make sure that I'm prepped and ready. So there's five colonies that I'll, I'll have to split here soon. So it'll be interesting. Greg, before you close it out, can I just say I really like these videos you're doing where you're just in the bee yard picking up the boxes with the cell phone. I like those live raw footage. I like those, man. And so that's a good, that's, you know, we, I, I love, I think you're the best, one of the best videographers in the business and uh, love those videos too, but you just, it's impossible to make the kind of content, enough content or as much as you probably want to make. And uh, I just really like you explaining what you're doing in the hives. It's just, I think it's going to be real beneficial and it, I really have enjoyed those couple of videos you put out. Yeah, I enjoyed it too. Yeah, I appreciate you guys saying that. It, it's uh, you guys know it, it, it's hard to <clears throat> sometimes just let things go and uh, just uh, do the best you can to to get something out. One thing that we, we we just keep hearing over and over and over again is you know we we would love we know you guys are busy. We would love to see more videos from the yard. We would love to see uh, more videos of you and Susie just talking about stuff. So we're you know right now 
you know, we're uh, we're just we're in the thick of it. We're we're trying to balance out uh, the supply business with the business of bees themselves. Uh, raise seven kids um, here on the farm and all the things that life has um, with that. And we are so grateful and thankful and blessed that this is where God has put us. That this is where our journey is. Uh, but truth be told, at, at times uh, it's overwhelming. At times it's a lot. Uh, at, at times you just are trying to literally put one foot in front of the other. And sometimes you feel like you're dragging down and you're grabbing your own boot and you're just pushing the one foot out in front of the other. Um, so it, it, it's, uh, it, I really appreciate you guys, um, you know, taking the time to watch the videos, even if they aren't uh, the, the bugs in the box or all the, the, the videos that we're kind of known for. Uh, we really appreciate you guys. You know, when we're in the, the in this grind and in this, this hustle of everything, um, you know, one of my favorite quotes, I, I got to shout out, uh, uh, retired army veteran, uh, Steve Riley from the uh, Fairfield County beekeepers association. It was absolutely an honor for us to uh, sit in on that club meeting, uh, where Steve kind of shared his first year in beekeeping. We were blessed with the opportunity, uh, to be able to give and to give, uh, the bees and the equipment, uh, to, uh, some veteran scholarships through the Fairfield County beekeepers association. So it was really cool last night to sit in and see Steve's presentation of what uh, his first year uh, looked like, and he did a, a tremendous job. But one of the quotes uh, that I, I absolutely uh, just adore uh, that he threw out there, I, I want to read that, um, that nothing in the world is worth having or worth doing unless it means effort, pain, and difficulty. That's uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, it goes on and on and on. But what a beautiful thing to think about. Whether it's beekeeping, your business, uh, your family, life. Remember, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. The things that are worth the pain and the difficulty and it being hard, those are the things that are worth doing, the things that are worth having, and the things that are worth passing down to the next generation. So I really appreciate uh, that sentiment. Steve did a great job. You know, coming up here this next week, you know, we're, we're prepping. We've got uh, another, our third package run is coming up. Uh, I can't thank everybody enough for all of their support. There's only a few packages even left on that route. Uh, and if demand uh, needs be, maybe we'll do another, uh, a fourth package run this year. Uh, we've got nukes that are going to be available uh, around June the 1st. Uh, we'd have, we have availability on those. We haven't even really tried to market or sell those. Uh, they're selling themselves. Uh, but those will be bees that are from our own stock that will have queens from our own genetic line, the Appalachian mutts. Um, folks, I think you'll love them. I think they're, it's, it's a great opportunity to bring those genetics into your apiary, not just for the joy of beekeeping, but the joy of bee breeding. And this year, what we're trying to really do is trying to do our best in bringing folks along with us as we kind of journey through what does bee breeding mean on this scale? Uh, wh what are we doing when we're grafting, when we're making the splits, when we're, when we're doing all these things? I know coming up and some upcoming videos, I think what we're going to do, even if it's just quick iPhone stuff, I'm going to take you along on this swarm that we just talked about tonight that I I'm setting up to be a cell starter. I'll take you along. I'll take you, we'll show you what I'm looking at, what I'm seeing, what I'm thinking. We'll take you along. There is some really fun stuff that we'll be using as we graft. I think you guys will find some value in a really cool stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a really is is insemination is artificial insemination for you. Believe it or not, you might be surprised. Uh, it's not that far fetched. It's definitely attainable. I've got a really fun video uh, to release uh, here in the near future uh, where we get into that with Dale McMahon at Apis Engineering and kind of go over some of those things. What a fun journey and a fun opportunity. Uh, instrumental insemination, artificial insemination but taking the genetics into your own hands. Wow. Talk about fast tracking decades uh, of open mating possibilities and put it right there in front of you. I'm really excited to share about that. I'm really excited about a video. Uh, believe it or not, I'm not the guy that does the cutouts or catches the swarms, uh, but it, they're still fun. And I've got a really fun video, probably the easiest swarm catch ever. Uh, you got to check it out. Really cool. That one's coming up soon too. A lot of fun stuff. 
We're going to do our best, try to get a lot more footage out. Uh, I also, on the podcast, if you check out our podcast on the audio format, our RSS feed, something happened. We're behind again, so I'm going to get all that audio caught back up. So if you like to binge on audio podcast while you're driving, the Nature's Image Farm podcast is going to have a bunch of stuff. You're going to start seeing, hitting your iPhone and telling you, new podcast, new podcast, new podcast. So we enjoy you. Uh, to, to be able to do that. Hope you guys are having fun with this too. Hey, I just want to thank Bruce and Brian, all the folks that are on here. You guys are family. We see you every single week. We love you guys. We appreciate you. Thanks for spending your evenings with us. It means everything. Next Wednesday, 8 p.m. Eastern, we'll be on, is it Brian's channel? See, I was a good guess. I had a 50-50. I knew it wasn't mine. It was either Bruce or Brian. So, Okay, Brian, next Wednesday, 8 p.m. Eastern, stream team, beekeeping chat, live on the Castle Hives YouTube channel. Again, thank you guys. You guys are awesome. As always, I want to remind you to be the lighthouse and be the change you want to see in this world. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.